One, two. All right, we are live on YouTube now. Thank you for your patience. Okay, can everybody hear us? Okay, perfect. Um, we are. Yeah, it took us a while to get the YouTube feed working, but it's working now. So um, to start the meeting off quickly, I just want to ask each of the committee members to introduce themselves. And then I believe per Sunshine Rules, identify whether there's anybody else in the room with you. Um, I'm gonna start with Michelle since she's on the top left corner of my screen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Bogardis. I'm the Deputy Field Supervisor for the Pacific Islands Fish and Wildlife Office. And Kate, there is no one else in the room with me. Although I have to admit, Earl sticks his head in from time to time. Uh, Lainey, you want to go? Hi, I'm uh, Lainey Berry uh, from Department of Land and Natural Resources, and there's nobody else in the room. But Lisa. Aloha, good morning. I'm Lisa Spain, and I'm a member at large for ESRC, and I reside on Hawaii Island. Jim. Morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Jim Jacoby. I'm biologist emeritus with uh, USGS, uh, representing US Geological Survey, Pacific Island Ecosystems Research Center uh, on the committee. And I'm by myself here. Kate, hey, Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Price. I'm representing the University of Hawaii, and there's nobody in the room with me. And Loyal. I'm Loyal Merhoff. I'm an, another at large ESRC member and there's no one else in the room with me. Thank you. We may as well have our AG do the same as a state rep, and then we'll hand it off to Don. Linda? Actually, so Linda Child, Deputy Attorney General, I'm assisting staff on this, but the um, Deputy AG who will be advising the ESRC is Miranda Steed. Miranda, please, please introduce yourself. I'm Miranda Steed. I'm the Deputy Attorney General from Land Division assigned to advise the meeting this morning. Thank you. So the meeting today is a presentation by KIUC on their um, developing HCP that should be going public shortly. And I don't know if Don or David wants to kick it off, but you can introduce your people and take it away. Aloha and good morning. Um, I'm Don Huff. I'm here today on behalf of KIUC. I'm the program manager of KIUC's Threatened and Endangered Species Program. And our team has been working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife for the past two years developing a habitat conservation plan. And we're looking forward to hopefully publishing the draft in early 2023. We want to thank you for this opportunity today to provide an overview of what you can discuss. Unfortunately, um, due to KIUC board committee meetings, David Bissell and other KIUC staff were not able to attend this meeting today. Um, but we do want to stress how important the, KI the HCP is to KIUC, both the development of the longer term HCP and the ongoing implementation um, of KIUC's program. Just a reminder to everyone that KIUC is a not-for-profit cooperative owned by its members and the sole provider of electrical services on the island of Kauai. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna hand it off to David Zippen, who's gonna lead us through the, the presentation. David? Great, thanks, Don. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, and I'm going to ask Tori Adele, who's our project manager, to go ahead and share her screen. She'll be running the PowerPoint slides and also helping with uh, timing 
for uh, the meeting to make sure we take some breaks. Um, we're the only agenda item uh, on your meeting today. Uh, we do actually have a lot to cover. Uh, so we're going to try and pace ourselves uh, and keep things interesting and, and make sure to address uh, your questions um, all along the way. So Tori, if you can share the presentation, we'll get started. Uh, maybe while she's doing that, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm the project director uh, for the HCP. Uh, I've been working on it uh, since ICF uh, took over the project a couple of years ago, actually in March uh, 2020. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we've been working on it um, ever since. Um, I also lead ICF's uh, practice in habitat conservation planning and implementation. Uh, so we write and implement HCPs around the country. Um, and I even uh, teach at the National Conservation Training Center that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service runs in West Virginia, um, how to prepare uh, habitat conservation plans and their NEPA documents. Sorry, just give me a second. I'm making sure that we've got this all set up correctly. Okay. Can you see the, oops, let me get rid of that, sorry. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Great. I'm going to move to the first slide, David, so feel free to start any time. Okay, terrific. Go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, there we go. Um, I wanted to start by introducing uh, the folks who are here today. I'll be giving the presentation, uh, but I'll be relying on um, several of our experts to answer any questions you may have along the way. Um, Dawn already introduced herself, um, as did I. Uh, Tori Adele is our, our uh, HCP project manager. Uh, we also have Ellen uh, Berryman, uh, who's our lead uh, biologist. Uh, John Brandon, who is our lead for the population dynamics model, uh, which we'll be talking about. Um, Andre Rainey is on, uh, who you've met before, uh, and with Archipelago Research and Conservation. Um, he is our expert on uh, the covered uh, seabirds uh, and water birds. And Kyle uh, Pius, also from Halix Ecological Restoration, who is our extra expert on predator control. Next slide. Um, so today what we'll be covering uh, is uh, really the other pieces of the habitat conservation plan that we did not already cover at the meeting uh, when we talked to you last back in uh, late January of this year. So um, there are a couple of changes uh, that I'll start with um, since we talked to you before, um, but the majority of the presentation uh, will be focused on the covered Seabirds in section one, uh, the covered water birds uh, in section two, uh, and in section three, uh, the green sea turtle. And for each of those species groups, uh, <clears throat> we will cover uh, effects, uh, the conservation strategy, uh, the monitoring and adaptive management program. So we just thought it would be easier to cover all three of those elements for each species group rather than jump around uh, within species since they're so uh, connected. Um, finally, in section four, I'll talk about cost funding and HCP implementation, um, something we, we weren't able to cover uh, in the January meeting. And in terms of format, um, since this is a fairly lengthy uh, presentation, uh, we want to uh, be able to answer your questions as you have them. So um, whenever you have a question, just raise your virtual hand or uh, put a question in the chat um, and we can be monitoring for those. Uh, and also I'll be stopping between sections uh, to take your questions as well as to take some uh, short breaks uh, between those sections. All right, let's move into a reminder of what we covered back in January. Um, we gave you some background on the HCP itself, 
um, introduce the full consultant team, uh, the status of the covered seabirds. We described the relationship between KIUC's current HCP and the short-term HCP, which ended in 2016, um, as well as the early implementation of this HCP, um, which we're defining as starting in, uh, in 2020. Um, we talked about many of the foundational elements of the plan, the covered species, the covered activities, uh, and some of the um, overviews of uh, what we'll be covering today in a lot more detail. Next slide. So a um, couple of changes uh, to note uh, since we talked to you in January. Uh, since then, we have uh, increased the requested permit term from 30 years to 50 years. And the primary reason for that is that we uh, need additional time to realize the benefits of the conservation measures, particularly at the conservation sites, um, in order to provide a net benefit to the covered seabirds. And I think that will become more clear as we get into those details of the population dynamics model. And hopefully, um, you'll understand why we need those extra 20 years. Go ahead and click through. And the other important change is that uh, recall that we uh, introduced the concept to you back in January of the 10 conservation sites. Um, and since that time, um, one of those conservation sites, um, Upper Manoa Valley, has become infeasible. So uh, we've had to uh, drop that site, um, and KIUC is now selecting a new site uh, to replace it. Uh, we're just simply calling it Site 10 um, for now. Um, that site uh, is likely to be located within the dashed purple line on the larger map, so certainly in close proximity uh, to the other nine conservation sites. Um, it will be selected using the criteria that we've outlined already, in the HCP and the many um, conservation sites uh, that have been identified to date as options. And it will have um, the same or greater benefit uh, to the Upper Manoa site. Um, and we have already modeled that site. Um, that uh, Upper Manoa site became infeasible relatively recently. Um, and so we're uh, committing to choose a site that will at least be as productive and beneficial as Upper Manoa. Um, it will also be occupied by Newell Shearwater um, and uh, will be able to uh, construct a predator exclusion fence. Um, I should add as well that um, KIUC intends to select that site and identify it um, prior to the final HCP, so it would be prior to um, incidental take license um, from uh, your agency. Just looking to see if there's any Can questions. I, quick, uh, quick question. Oh, yeah. Go Could ahead. you go, go through why you rejected the Upper Manoa site and uh, and then how that really relates to the potential that other sites may have that fall into the same criteria that you might reject them in the future? I'll let uh, Dawn take that question. Yeah. Hi. Um, we didn't actually reject the site. Uh, we were not able to come to uh, agreeable terms with the landowner. Um, so it was just an unfortunate uh, inability to reach agreeable terms so that we could implement the program and meet and meet requirements for a landowner agreement. So are, are you expecting that each of the sites will be available for that full 50 year term? We are, yes. And you've got assurances from the from the landowners or whomever controls it? For the other sites, um, assurances verbally, yes, we're in the process of working on draft landowner agreements, but we have reached um, what we understand to be verbal assurances uh, from the other landowners at the other sites. We just weren't able to get there with Upper Manila. Okay, thank you. I see also Loyal has his hand up. Yes, are the other sites on private land or on state land? Uh, other sites are, one of the other sites is um, 
in TBG National Tropical Botanical Garden, uh, the Upper Lima Huli site, and then the rest of the sites are on state land. DOFA, uh, actually na uh, natural area reserves um, managed by DOFA. And I believe we have a, a detailed list further in the presentation. Is that right, David? There is a list, although it does not indicate land ownership. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, looks like we can keep going. Go ahead, Tori. And that just shows where that upper Manila site used to be. Um, before we launch into the technical details, we did want to provide you a big picture of where we're headed, just so you can keep that in mind for context. We'll come back to this very same slide at the very end of the presentation and we can recap um, schedule and next steps. We have submitted um, the second administrative draft of the HCP uh, to the agencies. Uh, they're currently reviewing it. Uh, their comments are due uh, in just a few weeks. The environmental impact statement process has also begun. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service released uh, back in June um, in a notice of intent to prepare the EIS, uh, which kicked off a 30-day public scoping period. Um, and during that scoping period, there was a virtual public meeting, uh, scoping meeting that was held at the end of June. Um, as Don alluded to earlier, our intention is to release um, the public draft HCP on the state website uh, near the end of January. So in just about six weeks from now. And um, that would be just the HCP. So that would be separate from a later release of uh, the public draft HCP and the EIS. Um, but that uh, state release would kick off your typical 60-day uh, comment period, during which there would be a public hearing um, on Kauai and a site visit um, by the ESRC. Um, and as the last bullet shows, we're requesting uh, the week of March 6 to 10, uh, somewhere in there, uh, two days where would, there would be a, a public hearing and a site visit. So more to come on that. Um, we're planning for the summer, uh, most likely July of next year for the official uh, federal release of the public draft HCP and EIS together. They're always released together. Um, and that will give us time to incorporate um, many of the comments um, that we receive from the state review process. Um, after that, uh, there would be formal written comments or written responses uh, to all public comments received during that federal review. Uh, and then a final HCP and final EIS uh, would be published. Our expectation is uh, the spring of uh, 2024, perhaps earlier, uh, depending on the nature of the comments received in the summer. So any questions on schedule and next steps? Again, we'll come back to this at the end in case um, the rest of the presentation generates some more questions about that. Okay, well, let's dive in. So the first section is our longest one. Uh, this is where we're going to focus on the covered seabirds uh, and talk in a lot more detail about the effects analysis, conservation strategy, monitoring, uh, and adaptive management uh, for each of them. Um, so we'll, again, pause uh, quite often, um, and we'll, we'll take some breaks in between. Next slide. And these are the topics we'll cover. Next slide. Just a reminder, there are three covered seabirds, uh, the Newell Shearwater, uh, the Hawaiian Petrel, and the Band Rumped Storm Petrel. Next slide. Um, also a reminder, we did cover a little bit of this in January, uh, but we thought it was important to remind you of the various effects pathways for uh, the covered seabirds uh, from KIUC's um, operations. Um, an important one, of course, uh, is power line collisions. 
Uh, we have documented uh, collisions by Newell Shearwater and Hawaiian Petrel, uh, but there have been no documented collisions uh, with power lines for Van Rump Storm Petrel. However, we believe um, it probably does occur, just very rarely. Um, so we're, we're not able to base take, take estimates on actual data there, um, but um, we do have take limits defined, as you'll see later. Um, the detection of power line collisions uh, is something that's been refined uh, quite a bit over the last 10 years. Um, it's based on a combination of acoustic sensors and visual surveys in the field, which we'll, we'll talk about. And through all of that work, um, Andre and his team have been able to determine what the risk factors are for uh, power line collisions uh, and seabirds. Uh, and it varies by the height of the power lines, uh, by the configuration of the power lines, uh, primarily the number of vertical levels of uh, power line wires. Um, as well as the number of wires um, and their uh, physical location on the island, um, both locally as well as regionally. So because of all those factors, there's quite a bit of variation geographically around the island. Um, and ARC uh, has been able to um, estimate uh, the relative risk of power line collisions um, based on those collision risk factors. And that's what that map on the right shows is uh, that those lines are uh, KIUC's uh, power line system um, around the island. And uh, the highest risk areas are shown in red, the lowest risk areas in dark blue, uh, yellow, orange, and green uh, is in the middle. So um, those have been uh, the areas with the highest risk have been a focal area for um, a lot of activity and trying to reduce that risk. Um, of collision that we'll, we'll see later. Next slide. Oh, Jim, I think you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I presume these are showing your, your tall power lines, <clears throat> uh, but also your distribution lines, uh, which are much shorter than that. Are there, are, are there also collisions in those that, that you're, you're dealing with? There are, um, for the covered seabirds, the, the greatest risk is with the transmission lines because those are much taller. Um, they also tend to have the static wires on top um, as well as more um, vertical levels uh, to traverse. Um, but as we'll see later, the water birds, the covered water birds, uh, the collision risk is actually more with distribution lines as opposed to uh, transmission lines. So it does vary by species. Okay. All right, next slide. So just a few words about the methods of how uh, take from power lines, uh, power line collisions um, has been estimated. Uh, there's quite a bit of data um, collected and uh, you can see the date ranges there. Um, that is the range of data we've been using uh, to estimate take. Uh, as I mentioned, um, it's based primarily on acoustic sensors that are actually detecting the sound of the collision event itself. And those um, strikes are then um, fed into a Bayesian model um, to um, estimate annual strike rates um, while accounting for covariates. And that's done um, at the level of each power line segment. So you just remember that um, figure on the last slide. Um, each of those, uh, when colors change, those are uh, delimiting uh, different power line segments. Um, and we're able to estimate um, strike rates by segment. Now, there are some limitations to those data. Um, we don't know which species collide. The sounds a bird makes when it collides with a power line is indistinguishable by species. Um, so we have to make assumptions uh, based on um, observations uh, of collisions instead. As well, we also don't know uh, the outcome of those collisions. Not every collision is a uh, results in injury or mortality. So again, visual surveys and observations are needed um, in order to resolve that. Um, there have been over 6,000 hours of visual surveys conducted um, on KIUC's power lines. 
And during that time, 121 actual um, power line collisions uh, were observed. So based on those observations, um, we are able to estimate the, uh, the share of species. Um, and based on that, uh, we're assuming 70% of collisions are newer, newer shear water um, and 30% Hawaiian petrol. Um, we can also deduce outcomes um, from those observed uh, collisions based on the behavior of the birds immediately after colliding with those wires. And I'll explain that on the next slide. So as you're probably gathering, we're unable to measure um, injury or mortality directly. Um, it's hard enough to observe the collision. It's even harder to find birds uh, that may have been injured or killed as a result of those collisions. Um, so we can estimate the number of collisions, and that's the unit of take uh, that we've proposed to use in the HCP. And based on that, we can make assumptions of the fate of birds uh, that have collided in order to estimate injury and mortality. So as I mentioned in the last slide, we're basing that on those 6,000 hours of observation and the 121 collision events uh, that were observed. Based on that study, you can see the table below uh, where we are assuming that the outcome is uh, mortality of the seabirds if they are either um, immediately grounded, immediately grounded or crippled, or incapable of regaining flight after rehabilitation. And these are all categories of post-collision behavior um, that are in the paper cited above. For birds that experience an elevation loss but were not grounded, um, we've assumed injury. And then uh, for all the remaining birds, um, those birds are assumed to not either be uh, killed or injured. I think Loyal has a question, go ahead. So you, your first two categories, immediately grounded or immediately grounded or crippled, um, aren't those uh, kind of a duplication? They're not mutually exclusive, right? That would be a question for Ellen or Andre. Do, do you want me to answer that, David? Yes, please, sure, Andre. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Loyal, that's uh, if you, if you look at uh, Mark's paper um, that he just put out, he's he has an explanation for each of those categories. Um, and basically, every time that he notes a collision in the field, you or his team, um, he slots him into one of those various categories. And so, immediately grounded, the bird immediately drops to the ground. Um, the immediately grounded or crippled is the bird sort of losing height and uh, going down in the in basically looking like it's going to be grounded and um, with a severely compromised flight. And then the third one is also a bird which basically leaves the search area so he can't see what happens to it. It disappears out of sight from his uh, field of view, but it has a severely compromised flight. So those three categories are all birds that are um, have collided with the lines and in their post-collision flight path, they have some sort of severe compromised um, flight ability. Um, the injury one is any other bird that had an elevation loss um, but continued after losing elevation in a non-compromised flight um, status. So that one is, you know, it may, it, it'll continue onwards, but it could be compromised in that it has um, feather loss from uh, the collision itself, like losing feathers as it skims off the line, um, some sort of perhaps a uh, neurological issue potentially as it, as it disappears. So these are all different categories to estimate what happens to the bird after it hits a line. And we do know that many of the birds don't show any signs of injury at all. They just sort of skim off the line and, and keep going. Um, so, so I still don't understand some of those, but I'll go back and look at that later. But kind of a follow-up question on the third group, incapable of regaining flight after rehabilitation. Um, so it, is that a subset of the first two that are That's found? A that doesn't, I don't understand that either. The third one, I, the wording seems a little odd to me. It should be that it leaves the search area, but with compromised flight. What does the rehabilitation have to do with that? I think that's uh, 
I, 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 I would suggest that's something that's been written incorrectly. Like rehabilitation suggests that it went to SOS or something, but that's right. not that's not the case. This, these are not birds that are like picked up and taken somewhere. Okay, and you don't know the eventual fate of the fourth column, the injured ones, right? Some of them may be okay, but some may not be. Correct, and that you know that's always been the challenge with observing paraline collisions is that unless you see what happens to the bird immediately, i.e., it's grounded, you have no way of knowing what happens to it in the future. Um, some of these birds may be totally fine. Some of them um, may die, um, you know, when they get back to their burrows. So it's a it's a question mark, and this is the best um, way that we have of partitioning. Um, these birds each collision into a category that makes sense thank you laney i think you have a question go ahead yeah i just uh, this is probably another question for andre um this adds up to about 50 percent. i was just wondering what the other is the other 50 percent were they unknown or was that um yeah i was curious about that the the rest of them are down as birds that hit the line but are not affected, um, at least from the HCP point of view. Um, again, you know, it's hard it's hard to tell. We're, we're not there, so when the bird disappears out of view, but so we have to take our cues on what happens to the bird within our viewpoint and what what it's doing as it leaves the search area. Okay. Thanks. All right. Next slide, Tareem. So the reason we're focused on collisions is, of course, that is what we can measure. So we're defining that in the HCP as our measurable unit of take. Um, and KIC is requesting all take, um, so injury and mortality associated with the estimated power line strikes or collisions um, over the 50 year permit term for each covered seabird. Um, in addition to mortality and injury of the individuals, uh, that collide with the lines. Uh, we also have to take into account um, mortality of eggs or chicks as a result of a parent being injured or killed from a strike. So that is also another form of take um, that is associated with the power line collisions that were estimated. Next slide. So some of these we've uh, mentioned already. Um, it, the power line commit co collision estimate uh, is based on the, the data collection um, I mentioned earlier. And uh, in addition, uh, we've used the population dynamics model um, to factor in future uh, strike rates uh, based on uh, the population change over time. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the actual uh, power line collisions, uh, in other words, the, the take request itself is discounted by the amount of strike uh, risk reduction that you lost your audio. Yeah. Uh -oh. Is that just uh, we lost David? Did we lose him completely? Oh, is he still on here, or did he did he uh, disappear? Mm -hmm. oh, there he is. I think he disappeared. Mm. You might want to just give it a minute for him to sign back on. Yeah, sorry about that. We'll give it a minute. I'm going to ask him not to share his his face. Uh, <laughs> Because that may uh, be pulling down his bandwidth. Yeah. Still here. David, All can right. you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll turn my camera off and see if that improves things. Um, I also could switch to a different Wi-Fi if it if it still is a problem. It already seems a lot better without the video going. So. Without the camera. Okay, that's great. Yeah, it seems like the audio is improved on my end too. All right, so I was mentioning, I think when I dropped, uh, mentioning that our take limit or our requested take authorization is based also on our assumed 
rates of strike reduction uh, based on the uh, power line minimization projects uh, that we'll describe in a minute. Uh, and we're assuming for existing power lines that across the island, um, we'll be able to uh, reduce uh, strikes by 65%. For new power lines uh, that KIUC will be building into the future, um, we've assumed a higher uh, reduction of 80%. And that's in part uh, because with new lines, KIC will be able to, to site them better uh, for uh, lower uh, collision risk um, and also in configurations uh, that should also uh, reduce risk. Next David, slide. Oh, yeah. David, I'm sorry. I just want to jump in with a just a little bit of a clarification here. So when we use that language, 80% reduction in strikes, so new power lines, there's no reduction because there aren't existing lines. Um, but what that means basically is a reduction from what the strike rate would, would be like if the lines were configured in previous type of um, configurations. So sometimes that's confusing and I just wanted to clarify a little bit. Yeah, good point. All right, so this is our... Uh, requested take authorization for each of the covered seabirds over the 50 years of the permit. And this takes into account um, all of the factors uh, that we were describing earlier um, and does include the uh, strike reduction uh, assumptions uh, that we were just discussing. So uh, if you look at the column on the left, um, the requested number of power line strikes um, is what we can measure. Um, so that's uh, the requested strikes, but that is not what we estimate for either uh, mortality or injury. So those are the fractions on the right-hand side of our assumptions of, of the total number of strikes that do occur, um, how many result in mortality, how many result in non-lethal injury, and uh, the estimated uh, indirect take of egg and chicks, um, that is dependent on the proportion of strikes that are adults. So um, the take request is for the full um, 50 years of the permit term. Um, if you divided those numbers by 50, you can get an estimated sort of average annual. Um, we're not expressing them that way here, uh, in part because there's a lot of variation uh, from year to year. Uh, in actual strikes. Uh, but just to give you a sense of what those numbers are, uh, for Newell Shearwater, the average annual strikes is um, 704. The average av annual uh, estimated mortality is 202. Uh, for injury, it's 173. And for eggs and chicks, um, it's 75. So when you add Mortality, injury, and eggs and chicks, uh, that comes to 450 Newell Shearwaters per year um, over the 50-year permit term. And you can see uh, the numbers there for Hawaiian petrol. Now that's in part because if you recall, the lower proportion of strikes that were observed uh, were Hawaiian petrol. It was that 70% Newell Shearwater, 30% Hawaiian petrol. Uh, for band road storm petrol, it's, of course, a much, much lower number, um, and those are um, estimates uh, just based on um, what we think uh, that very low, low level of take is likely to be. All right, next slide. All right, um, another effects pathway that we discussed last time was take from light attraction, uh, which from KIUC facilities comes from three sources. Uh, the first and by far the most common would be uh, the street lights across the island that KIUC operates, over 4,000 of them, uh, which are shown in red uh, on the figure. So of course they're concentrated in uh, urban areas or uh, residential areas. 
Facility lights is another source. Um, those are shown on the map with the two yellow triangles uh, at the Kapaya generating station and uh, the Port Allen generating station. And then finally, um, nighttime construction, uh, which uh, is needed occasionally for power restoration. Uh, and if that nighttime construction lighting occurs during the seabird fledging season, uh, that could be a source of light attraction as well. Now, this primarily affects Newell's shearwater, but it does affect uh, Hawaiian petrel and Van Rump storm petrel as well. Um, and the factors are that um, this is really affecting um, mostly fledglings that are making their very first trip uh, to the ocean uh, to forage. And this is a very novel uh, thing for them. Uh, they're mistaking uh, lights for um, the light of the moon uh, and they'll circle the lights. They're, they'll get very tired and exhausted. They'll fall to the ground, hence the name fallout, um, where they're unable to uh, regain flight. Um, so once they're grounded, they do often um, die from their injuries uh, or uh, predated. Next slide. Um, the methods we use to estimate take from light attraction uh, varied by source. Uh, for the existing street lights, uh, we conducted some uh, light attraction modeling uh, that HD Harvey and Associates performed. I'll explain that a little bit more on the next slide. For new street lights uh, that KIUC will be operating uh, into the future, um, we applied the same uh, model assumptions uh, to those new street lights. Uh, for those two facilities, um, that's a case where KIUC has actually been monitoring uh, the facilities since 2011, uh, and they do occasionally find um, down birds um, at their facilities, uh, mostly at Port Allen, but uh, there has been one observed at Kapaya. And so based on those data, we can extrapolate out into the future um, what the fallout is likely to be there. Um, for emergency nighttime lighting, um, for power uh, restoration, KIUC provided some estimates of how often that is likely to occur. Um, but because it's likely to be for such a short duration um, and uh, occur uh, quite rarely during uh, the seabird fallout season, um, we're not increasing the take limit as a result. We believe that the take limit for street lights is conservative. In other words, it overestimates an actual fallout and that um, uh, that would be inclusive of any very low level of take that might occur from nighttime lighting. Next slide. Um, just a few more words on that um, light attraction modeling that HG Harvey did. Um, they assessed uh, some uh, recent uh, radiance data uh, that uh, an orbiting satellite measures on a regular basis um, and partitioned uh, the radiance uh, spatially uh, into various sectors or geographic areas within the island, the same sectors that the Save Our Shearwaters program uses, um, and then uh, chose certain areas where there was uh, only one street light, so the light in that area uh, was uh, only coming from um, a single street light, and that gave them uh, a benchmark uh, to scale up uh, to uh, larger parts of the island. And estimates were derived for different parts of the island for each sector uh, based on uh, the radiance and number of street lights uh, in uh, each of those sectors. And then they applied a correction factor to account for seabirds that were grounded, um, but not detected. Next slide. Um, this is the estimate uh, that we came up with for uh, requested take in the form of fallout uh, for each of the three uh, covered seabirds over 50 years. Um, it does combine the estimates for streetlights, uh, the two facilities, um, as well as inclusive of, of nighttime uh, emergency construction lighting. Uh, and the assumption is that half of the fallout results in mortality and half results in non-lethal injury. This is the same assumption that was used uh, in the Kauai Seabird HCP 
Um, we really don't have data on this, so it is somewhat of, of an arbitrary assumption, but we want it to be um, consistent uh, with the Kauai Seabird HCP. Next slide. And then finally, there's uh, the, another source of uh, take of mortality uh, and non-lethal injury as a result of the conservation strategy itself. Um, the predator control uh, within the conservation sites include setting uh, traps for, uh, for cats uh, and other uh, mammals. And occasionally, the covered seabirds are caught uh, in those predator control traps. We do have data on this um, for the last six or seven years um, at six of the conservation sites. So we were able to use that data and extrapolate it out to the 10 sites and over um, 50 years. So you can see the requested take numbers there uh, for each of the species. We're not anticipating um, any take from this source for band rump storm petrel. Um, but more so um, in this case for Hawaiian petrol. Okay, next slide. All right, well, this is a good time for a short break, uh, but before we take a break, any questions on what we've covered so far, the estimated take from these various sources of injury and mortality from KIUC's covered activities. Is that, I, I noticed the numbers are so much lower for band room storm petrels. And I was just wondering if, if um, they're under detected in the surveys due to smaller size and so may not be represented there. Like is this proportional to their population size? And so estimated take based off of that, or are they less likely to strike lines or just less likely to be detected, but just as equally impacted? That's a great question. I'm going to see if Andre has an answer. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, in terms of the power line collisions and observations, um, they are, they're rarely observed in the areas, um, you know, where the power lines are. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, where storm petrels are on, um, on Kauai, they're mainly the Nepali coast and Waimea Canyon. Um, and so, and then there's small pockets of them in places like uh, Wainiha and Numahai. Um, but broadly speaking, they're in an area which is less affected by power lines. I think if uh, they were hitting power lines in large numbers, certainly the teams would see them because, you know, even though they are a small bird, um, the teams regularly see bats, you know, record bats and so on. That's a, a similar site. Uh, size and um, they are quite a maneuverable species when you watch them flying around you know they're quite uh, they, they they're quite jerky but they, they're quite capable of moving um, really rapidly and at, sh at short notice so probably from a power line collision point of view I think um, you know if it was a major issue we'd see it light attraction um, they are a small species and they are a species which um, the general public is less aware of um, they uh, they're also you know, they're, when they hit the ground, those guys, they, they really do like to hide in small places. So it's possible that they are underrepresented in light attraction um, scenarios, um, just because people don't know, know to look for them and because they're small and, and highly maneuverable on the ground. Um, but we did get one in our office this year, um, a sort of fairly down covered bird um, that came from Waimea. So when people find them there, some people are handing them in for sure. So to summarize, if I'm hearing, I just want to check if I'm hearing you correctly. Um, the power line data you think is fairly accurate because there aren't the power lines in the areas, but um, for lights, they may be underrepresented um, relative to the, the um, down fledgling potential. Uh, that would be my opinion. Any other questions? Um, I had a question, um, maybe more of a theoretical question, but does the, the estimated take in over the period, um, the 50 year period, is that sort of, does that take into account, is that like based on past population estimates or does it, how do you take into account 
whether the like if there's a massive increase in the population then you might increase the take and and then also if there's a you know the population continues to decline that might decrease the take great question laney we will get to that when we oh. talk about the population dynamics model so yeah okay that. great michelle David, would you mind going back a couple slides to the estimates of mortality associated with down birds from light attraction? Sure, Tori can navigate backwards. Right, yeah, give me a second. I'm going. Sorry. Apparently, I'm going forward, not backwards. So, give me a second. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Tori. Um, so you wanted to see, I think it's the table, Tori, that refers to the take levels associated with um, down birds from light attraction and the mortality. Oh, light attraction. With that. Yeah, thank you. Yes. This one, correct? I can't, we can't see your screen at the moment, oh, Tori. can't? Oh, sorry, sorry. Excuse <laughs> me. This one. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, I just wanted to clarify on this one where, you know, we're talking, I think David referred here to 50% of fallout results in non-lethal injury that only occurs if birds are actually picked up and handed to SOS. A hundred percent of the birds that are on the ground and not picked up are assumed dead, correct? That's probably a question for Ellen. And, and we, we don't necessarily need to resolve that now. I just wanted to make sure that both in the document and in the language that we use around those take estimates that we're being really clear about what percentage of the birds we anticipate it just to be mortality versus, or what percentage do we expect to only be injury versus mortality? Can you hear me, Michelle? Oh. I can't. Ellen, I think I you need to mute one of your, either your phone or your computer. Okay, well, we'll come back to that question because I'm seeing more hands going up um, and, and we are already behind schedule. Uh, Can you hear I, me I, now? Oh. Uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead? I think you're uh, first in line there. Okay, yeah, for both of your take categories, your tables, uh, both from light and, and collisions, um, you've got it for 50 years, and then you said, you know, to go on an annual, just divide by 50. Um, and I think that's 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 sort of a, a, a reasonable estimate. That being said is, is do you have any, if you're seeing that your take is, is your annual take is above those, that, that, that estimated, you know, divided by 50 value, uh, do you have any triggers that, that might say, well, maybe things aren't working right, especially in the early years when you're really not sure exactly how, how things are going, whether your models are actually working the way you think, uh, that, that may cause you to rethink um, either your mitigation strategy, excuse me, your management strategy, uh, or possibly increase or decrease your, your, your estimated take um, request? Yes, we do. And we'll talk a little bit later about the uh, monitoring adaptive management program, which does have quantitative triggers, uh, exactly how you describe them. Yes. Right. Great. Thank you. 
Sure, Melissa. Yeah, hey, thank man. you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I'm still echoing, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so two things. One, um, I would echo what Michelle said as far as um, the 50-50 seems um, not realistic based on the fact that very few are going to get detected and picked up and brought for rehab. And so the number of assumptions of mortality for fallout should be much higher. Two, there's definitely adult fallout that occurs um, both earlier in the season when they're returning to nest and throughout the season. And so 0% of fallout assumption from adults, I don't think is accurate. I don't have a great number for what it is, but I don't think it's a non-zero number. Okay, thanks for those comments. Uh, Loyal, I think you're next and then David. Yeah, I also uh, wanted to echo the um, estimates of mortality from the fallout. And even with the uh, Kawhi Seabird at HCP, that one I don't believe incorporated the most um, current estimates of um, say SOS um, mortality. And so I think that you would be advised to, to go back and look at that number from that perspective as to the, what the SOS uh, success rate is, as well as looking at um, probably a more realistic estimate of the actual number of down birds that are found, which I think is right now, if it's 50%, I think that's probably an overestimation is the number found. So those are my only two points. Thanks. And I'll lower my hand now. Thanks, Loyal. David, go ahead. Yeah, I have, I have several comments and questions, so I'm not sure with your protocol if I should just do them one at a time and then go back in the queue or, or just go through them all. Um, I think we can go through them all. Uh, there's a chance we might be covering them later in the presentation, so I might ask you to sure. hold them until later, but why don't you go ahead. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just the things that you've already presented. So um, starting uh, with the uh, the, you know, I'm going to just echo what folks have been saying about the amount of mortality uh, from street light attraction, other light attraction. Um, um, Michelle, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, any bird that is not actually discovered and turned in is assumed to be dead. Uh, and in the KSHCP, you had participants who were actively searching their properties during the fallout season. The protocol was to do it, you know, I think it's a couple of hours after sunset and a couple of hours before sunrise. So with respect to all the streetlights that KUC has, I would be surprised if you're proposing that you're going to have uh, that type of level. Uh, well, actually, I, I doubt you're going to have any uh, uh, searcher uh, component. So I don't think you're going to be walking the entire island looking under your streetlights for down birds. So all of those birds uh, that are going to be attracted uh, should be assumed to be mortality. And so that's a, a, a massive undercounting in terms of what you're, you've been talking about so far. I'll, I'll pause in case you have a response to that. I'll look to the other team members to, to answer it directly. Remember though that the requested take um, that we um, have in the HCP is all fallout. So um, as you point out, we're not able to measure um, actual uh, mortality or actual non-lethal injury, except for those birds that the SOS program volunteers are collecting. Um, that's the only thing we can measure. So um, really the take request is that first column. Uh, which is, uh, of course, a combination of the, the mortality and non-lethal injury. And we'll, we'll certainly take into account your comments to um, take another look at the um, allocation of mortality versus non-lethal injury. Yeah, but with respect, your assumption is that only half of the fallout is going to be non-lethal. And so, again, in the and you said that's arbitrary. I agree, it is arbitrary, and therefore it can't be the basis of an HCP. You then said, however, it's consistent with the KSHCP, and I'd respectfully submit that it's not at all. Uh, the K what you've got with the SOS program <clears throat> is you have these opportunistic things where people happen to be driving along the road and pick up a bird and turn it in. 
that's almost none of the birds get recovered that way. I mean, that's 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 near zero. And in fact, I would say uh, in an HCP, you just should assume that it's zero. Um, you know, uh, it's only where you've got a dedicated searcher effort, which you're not going to have. I, I don't believe that's a component of your plan, uh, where you get anywhere near 50%. And as Loyal mentioned, um, a lot of the properties participating in KHCP uh, have been far, far lower than 50% uh, in terms of their efforts to actually recover birds. So any bird that is not actually picked up, uh, that comes down, that then hides by going under a bush or something is out of sight, and so no motorist is going to notice them, they're all dead. Um, so, uh, you know, when if you're predicting fallout, num your predicted fallout numbers should be virtually all mortality, and the burden should be on you to prove that any of them are non-lethal, because you got nothing in the HCP that I'm aware of uh, that would that would justify a conclusion that they're not all going to die. Um, my next comment and question is, um, what is the basis, I, I didn't understand, what is the basis of your estimate of take reduction uh, with respect to the power line adjustments? Have you, you know, you, a number of the power line adjustments have been in place for some period of time. So is there data that you're going to be relying on in the HTP to justify your assumption that an existing power line uh, will have a reduction of 65%? Uh, yeah, the the estimate for 65% uh, across the island is based on measurements, observations of collisions and uh, recordings of um, strikes with the acoustic sensors, both before and after the power line minimization occurs. So in other words, before a power line is reconfigured and after or before the bird flight diverters are installed and after. So they are comparisons um, of pre and post treatment um, at the uh, actual segments. And so we've combined all of those um, across the island to come up with that, uh, that 65%. But I'll, I'll open it up to Andre to see if he wants to add anything more to that answer. Yeah, um, yeah. So sort of to echo what David said, for diverters, um, it's uh, those ratio, those percentages have come up from uh, actual observations by our team in the mountains and areas with and without diverters before and after treatment. Um, we've also for static wire removal um, modeled it as well using the Bayesian model, um, using flight heights and um, uh, the sort of uh, exposure height of, um, of power lines. But you know, those those percentages, I think one of the key components here is that for the next um, three years, we will also be um, doing observations to ensure that those percentages are correct, that minimization efficacy is correct. So it's based on a combination of models, existing data, and will be continued to be tested over the next three years in areas where minimization is occurring to make sure that those percentages are correct. Okay, well, I'm I'm happy to hear that, and uh, you know, we'll look forward to reviewing those data in connection with the draft HCP. Um, uh, I then, you know, just as a matter of logic, I, I don't understand why there's an assumption that a new power line, so a new power line, presumably will be put in place with a a line configuration that is uh, more. Uh, you know, taking the measures that need to be done to protect seabirds and going to have the diverters on it. Why all of a sudden does that have a 15% greater reduction? Or as Don correctly pointed out, it's not a reduction, but we're expecting it's going to kill birds at the, at the same rate as the existing ones. Why is it now, you know, an 80% reduction rather than just the 65%? Why is a new line going to be less bird killing than an old line that's been adjusted? Um, so, Andre, I'll... Also, if you want to add anything to this, but I can speak to this from in terms of the estimate of 80% that came from the same data that Andre's talking about, um, data collected on um, minimization already applied on existing lines. So essentially that's assuming with new line configuration, we know, we understand um, horizontal structures better than vertical. We understand height is an issue. All of all of the all of the things that we would potentially apply in a reconfiguration would be applied to the new line design. 
as well as minimization um, for the specific area, whether it be LED diverters or reflective diverters. Um, those in combination, the estimated efficacy for those is actually higher than 80%. Um, we, we just conservatively used 80%, assuming that those new, that is part of the program as new lines would take into account all the things that we know, um, and that would be factored into the design. So again, it's based on the data collected for on, on existing lines, minimization applied to existing lines, um, and assuming that those, that those techniques would be applied in the new new line design. Okay, so if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, Don, what I'm hearing is that um, for the design of a new line, you can make them even better than the old lines than a reconfigured old line because you'll take into account height and the horizontal and you'll put in place all the diverters. Did I get that right? Um, I didn't, uh, oh. what I'm saying is instead of constructing the lines like we would have five years ago or 10 years ago, we would be able to construct the lines with a configuration in mind of bird risk, bird flight risk, um, plus the minimization that would be applicable in the area that we know um, is effective. So it would be the combination of those things for new lines going in place. And so then my follow-up question would be for existing lines, given that you're seeking a 50-year HCP, so something that's gonna be in place for half a century, so we're not talking about overnight, if the legal obligation is to minimize take to the maximum extent practicable, why aren't we getting the existing lines and particularly the, the existing lines in the highest risk areas, uh, why aren't we modifying those to achieve the same 80% reduction? Some of them have been modified. Um, some of the minimization that's being applied in certain areas has actually a, a greater percent estimated efficacy than 80%. Um, we've taken the estimated efficacy numbers that we have and planned minimization across the system to, to the greatest extent practicable. Um, some lines have been reconfigured. Um, and I there's quite a bit more information about that in the HCP so itself. So it might be best to review that document and then follow okay. up with any questions after that. Uh, okay, we, we definitely will do that and appreciate that. Um, a couple of questions about uh, uh, the mortality and injury. Uh, sorry, David, can I, can I just um, mention, oh, sorry, I just want to butt in just for really quickly. Um, just want to remind people not to put comments in the chat in the Zoom um, because that's not available on YouTube. Um, so please refrain from discussing in the chat. Thanks. Sorry, go ahead. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, so with respect to the estimates um, on mortality associated with line strikes, there were a couple of questions that I had. Um, the first one is with respect to the assumed non-lethal injury. Um, so as I understand it, um, uh, there are birds that strike the lines uh, they do lose altitude, so there was something that happened, and I, I believe the, the assumption is that either it is physical in that they lost some feathers, or it could be neurological. Um, but they, they lose altitude, but they, they, they're not immediately grounded, um, uh, and, um, and, and such. And so the, the, you know, the assumption that you put in there is that it's a non-lethal injury, but what I heard from Andre, is that you actually have no idea what happens to the bird after it has such an event. It could go back to its burrow and die. Um, and so my question is, um, if you're trying to do an HCP that is adequately precautionary, I mean, you're basically assuming the best case outcome for KIUC, which is that a bird that suffers this type of injury, uh, and we don't know if they're going to live or die, that they live. Um, so why, why isn't there a certain percentage of those that then are considered to be a mortality?
This would really be the best question answered either by Ellen or Andre. Um, Ellen, are you able to speak now? Um, I see Ellen's got in the chat that she doesn't have audio. Oh. Um, I guess I guess I can I can take a stab at that, David, and that's um, for sure. You know, like we are we have to make assumptions, and we don't know what happens to birds when they fly out of the field of view unless they're grounded, um, and unless they're you know physically picked up and on the floor. And presumably, even if they are not physically picked up, if they're on the on the floor, they're dead, um, which is which is one of the assumptions that's made within the HCP. Um, there are within that 28.8% of the most severe post collision flight categories. Um, some of those birds, um, you know, they are, they do continue to fly out of the field of view. And some of those could, I suppose, be considered to not die um, and continue on to a colony um, and survive. So there's a bit of like a bit of um, mortality in there, which could potentially just be considered an injury. Um, on the flip side, 20, those 24.5% of birds. Um, where they suffer an elevation loss but then fly away they are within a category which is not considered to be a compromised flight so um i don't know within from an hcp point of view you know how you would deal with um with that group of birds but i guess within the, for the h for this H, purposes of this hcp all those birds are considered to be injured and some of those birds are probably not injured um some of them you know are fine and some of them will have feather loss um and uh and could yeah, I mean they could they could die when they go back to their burrows. So perhaps I'm just speaking myself here. Um, but with that 24.5 percent, if they're all considered to be injured, and some of them are injured, and some of them are, some of them are dead, and some of them are not injured at all, maybe it all compensates for itself. Um, but we do have to make assumptions with what we see these birds. What what happens to these birds once they leave the field of view? And that's the assumption that's been made for this HCP. Okay, um, I hear you, Andre. I appreciate it. Um, I have we haven't yet. Um, seeing the briefing about how then KUC is accounting for the different types of take and and um, whether the, you know how how they're conferring the net conservation benefit and making sure uh, that they mitigate to the maximum extent practicable. I just I, I just want to say that uh, as a comment that um, anytime you're making a conservative assumption, which is that they're all dead. Uh, then you're certainly living up to the spirit and letter of the law. Anytime you make an assumption uh, that they all live when a subset of them may die, uh, I think you're coming into tension with both the uh, purposes and letter of the law. Um, but, you know, until we see the whole HCP can't say. So I'll make just a similar comment. I'm, I'm mindful of time and I appreciate the opportunity to offer these comments. With respect to birds uh, that are assumed to be not injured at all, so they hit the line, they don't lose altitude, and they're all assumed to, they're not, there's no take that happened, basically. There's no, there's no mortality, or there's no non-lethal take. Um, once it leaves the field, you have no idea what happened to it. So it's, that's just not a precautionary assumption that, a, that you know, 100% of them that are not immediately observed to have lost altitude are fine um, and are not going to suffer longer term injury or, or mortality as a result of that uh, interaction. So so again, I, I just, there seems to be a lot of bias here uh, in terms of the light attraction assumptions and in terms of collision assumptions against finding injury and mortality um, that doesn't seem to be justified by the data. Um, that's just more of a comment. Uh, I don't know if you want to, you know, provide anything about why you feel confident that if they didn't lose altitude, there's no injury. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, um, I, I think some of this is, I, I know that <laughs> these things are addressed in the HCP. So I think some of this is um, best discussed after the HCP is published, but um, I just, I don't know, I'm not hearing from David Zippen, so I don't know if we lost him, but I just want to clarify that the, the take is based on strikes, not mortality or injury. So the, the take is based on every strike on the line. Um, so D David, I don't know if you can say more about that. Um, yeah, that's right. The take request is based on the number of strikes, which is the only sure. thing we can measure somewhat accurately. So um, I think we, we all understand that 
partitioning those into mortality, non-lethal injury, indirect take of eggs and chicks is very difficult because of the very limited amount of data we have, observational data on uh, what happens to birds um, after um, they strike the line. So uh, we're certainly open to reconsidering these assumptions. Um, David, you mentioned based on available data, if you have other data that we didn't consider, um, we'd certainly be happy to take a look at that um, in order to uh, reconsider our assumptions. But our, our take request is based on um, all mortality, non-lethal injury, and indirect take of eggs and chicks associated with that number of power line strikes. Okay, I, I hear you. And and just again, the general comment is that um, if the data are inconclusive, uh, the 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 species shouldn't suffer as a result of that. The the assumption should be precautionary and and protective of the species. That's what the law. Um, leans towards in order you, you, it's the burdens on you to prove a net conservation benefit not on the species um i just said this that's a comment um and, and then i have just one question and this is purely procedural uh so forgive me if i'm not understanding or um uh it sounds like the public draft hcp uh will go out on the state website in january and then there'll be a separate process for a draft HCP at the federal level that's going to happen half a year later. I know that I'm going to get questions from the public about, you know, when they're supposed to comment, when they're supposed to engage. Why are they happening at different times? Hi, I just want to address that really quickly. Um, we are going out on the state side first because on the federal side, the HCP and the EIS post as a package, which causes a significant delay. We would recommend that everyone comment um, as soon as possible. So that would be on the state posting. And that would hopefully allow time for those comments to be incorporated into the next version, which would be the federal posting. Okay, but then will there be, a, if there's a revision, then presumably the state's going to go with a revised version, right? Is yeah. That, okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. David, I'll just chime in and say that that's also something that the Fish and Wildlife Service recommends this process. So we're, we are appreciative of the opportunity to receive public comments to the state process first so it can inform a strong document going into the, um, the version that we would put out in the Federal Register. Okay, uh, no, that, that's great. Thanks for the clarification. And again, thanks for the opportunity and the presentation. And this is Kate again. I'm just going to read Ellen's comment in the chat so that we can capture it for the YouTube record. Um, it relates to fallout. And she says that while they did consider making mortality rates higher for fallout, they decided to use the KSHCP as precedent, but it is reasonable to increase mortality for fallout as a rate. Um, that's what she posted in the chat. Okay. And, and if she had given me that answer, I would have said, if you actually read the KSHCP, any bird that is not actually found and picked up is a mortality, and there is not going to be dedicated searchers two hours before, uh, after sunset and before sunrise under these street lights. So it's going to be purely opportunistic. So it's pretty much all mortality. Thank you, David. You don't have uh, Melissa, I think Thank you have you. a question. And we yeah, want so, to move on. Yeah. Okay. I had put, yeah, I had put my hand up uh, when that comment had been put in the chat. And I just wanted to confirm from my perspective too, um, I would want to see an, an assumption of 100% mortality for fallout given the, um, the lack of search effort that's present in the HCP um, and the, you know, low likelihood of actually finding fallout um, in this situation um, and an increase in the adult um, mortality assumed due to fallout. Um, the other thing I just wanted to ask a question about, I don't know if you have answers for this now, but just noting, I think Maui County just passed some ordinances regarding standards for um, uh, infrastructure to minimize uh, impacts to seabirds. I think their intention is to look at implementing those on other islands or even statewide. And I'm just wondering, given that this is a 50 year HCP, if those kinds of things are being considered to be consistent with that standard set by the, um, the Maui ordinance and um, 
if you're going to address that in the next portion of the presentation, I can wait and take the answer at that time. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Yes, we will address that uh, later in the presentation when we talk about the conservation measures for light attraction for um, sea turtles in particular. Uh, but uh, beyond that, we don't have um, a conservation measure uh, regarding um, light attraction for seabirds because KIUC has already modified all the street lights on the island uh, to address as much as they can at this point. All right, let's move on. Uh, um, just sorry, just before you go, just for the record, I want to um, read out what was in the chat. Um, it's from Ellen. Uh, it says, we did consider making the mortality rate higher for fallout, but decided to use Kauai Seabird HCP since it was a precedent. It's reasonable to increase mortality mortality fallout, mortality rate for fallout. Thanks, Lane. Okay, Tori, next slide. All right, uh, before we get into uh, the conservation measures, I just wanted to provide a little context. Um, we don't have time to go through all of the biological goals and objectives um, in the conservation strategy, but I wanted to highlight uh, this one, uh, which is similar for both Newell Shearwater and Hawaiian Petrol um, and relates to uh, the net benefit standard um, in the Hawaii Revised Statutes. Um, the goal is essentially to provide for the survival of the Kauai metal population of the species and to contribute um, to the species recovery. And again, we have separate goals for each species. Um, we do this by minimizing uh, the take of those species and also fully offsetting uh, the impacts of KIUC's uh, taking of those species. And we do so um, to an extent that we believe is likely to result in um, improvement in the number of breeding pairs, um, improvement in uh, demography and age structure, uh, in a stable or increasing uh, population growth rate, um, and in improved spatial distribution. Uh, and I'll go over in a minute how we quantify each of those. Um, but the, the bottom line is that our goal uh, here is uh, to uh, essentially help create a viable metapopulation of each species on Kauai. Next slide. Now, of course, viable has a lot of uh, different meanings, uh, and we're not uh, including in the HCP a population viability analysis uh, specifically, um, but we are um, defining uh, measures of uh, population status that uh, we believe contribute to uh, and uh, would be consistent with um, a viable metapopulation. And that's in terms of breeding pairs, population growth rate, um, and demography and, and age structure. Uh, so just as a reference point, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and DOFA have um, estimated that for uh, the Kauai metapopulation of, of each species, uh, that a minimum size needed for viability would be um, approximately 10,000 individuals and 2,500 uh, breeding pairs. Um, and that certainly if for a pop meta population to be viable, uh, the population growth uh, rate would need to be stable or uh, improve increasing. Um, and then growing populations uh, tend to have larger proportions of younger individuals. Uh, we don't want a population that is um, imbalanced with only older individuals, which would indicate uh, an ultimate uh, decline in that population. Next slide. So we've defined very specific and mostly quantitative uh, metrics for each of the two uh, primary covered seabirds um, in order to um, operationalize those concepts. And this is also tied very closely to uh, the monitoring and adaptive management program. Uh, we've set deadlines in some cases uh, for certain metrics to be met well before uh, the end of the permit term. Some of these metrics are measured uh, annually, um, others um, less often. 
um, but they're all tied to uh, the need to achieve those uh, minimum uh, breeding pair estimates uh, to a stable or, or increasing uh, metapopulation on the island. Um, and they're applied to all of the 10 conservation sites combined. These are the areas that we can uh, influence and uh, are the focus um, of the conservation strategy um, offsite. Next slide. Similar also for uh, Hawaiian petrel, uh, there's a couple of fewer metrics here because we uh, do not play in social attraction uh, for Hawaiian petrel, uh, but otherwise um, similar um, quantitative metrics. Next slide. The HCP goes into a lot more detail, of course, of how we derive those uh, quantitative metrics and provides the rationale for each of them. So I wanted to give you that context as we walk through each of the conservation measures. Uh, and then we'll talk about the uh, population dynamics model, which uh, synthesizes all of it. Uh, we talked about this a little bit already, uh, the types of uh, power line collision minimization uh, that KIUC has uh, mostly um, already implemented uh, across the island, whether it's static wire removal, uh, installing bird flight diverters, which is pictured on the right with uh, reflective diverters. There's also LED diverters in some places, and then uh, power line reconfiguration uh, where that's feasible. Uh, and so based on all of that, we expect a uh, strike reduction of 65% uh, uh, across the island for existing lines um, based on uh, the information listed there as well as um, the validation monitoring that Andre mentioned earlier, that would occur uh, until 2026. Um, so far, uh, actually, the monitoring they've been conducting uh, indicates that these estimates um, are accurate and, and we expect to, to hold over time. And then a greater uh, reduction in strike risk uh, relative to what a, an existing power line would look like uh, if it were in the same location uh, because of what Don explained earlier, um, the uh, improved ability to site them and design them and construct them uh, to have lower collision risk. Next slide. Oh, and I should mention that all of these uh, power line collision minimization projects are expected to be completed by the end of next year. These maps just show the geographic extent of those projects. On the left, um, we have where um, both the LED and reflective diverters have been installed on KIUC system. Uh, purple is the reflective diverters, yellow is LED, so the green, small green segments are the only places where those diverters um, have not been installed for uh, safety reasons. And on the right, uh, the removal of static wires is shown in red, um, and that equates to approximately 81% of the mileage of all static wires uh, will have been removed uh, by the end of next year. Next slide. Now to minimizing light attraction. Uh, this is uh, very important, of course, to reduce the risk of fallout. And uh, the recommendations have been to have uh, full cutoff shielding on lights to uh, direct um, all light downward instead of out to the sides or upward. And this is what KIOC has actually already done. Um, they've installed full cutoff shields on all of their uh, over 4,000 uh, existing streetlights on the island. Those same full cutoff shields uh, will also be uh, part of any new streetlights uh, that would be installed over the next 50 years, which we estimate at just over 1,700. For the two facilities, uh, Kapaya and uh, Port Allen, um, KIUC um, is shielding uh, those exterior facility lights, uh, sorry, has shielded uh, those facility lights uh, and has been dimming those lights um, during the uh, fallout season. And those actions will continue during uh, the HCP. Next slide. 
We've mentioned the Save Our Shearwaters program. KIC since 2003 has been the major um, funder of that program on Kauai, uh, where they rescue, uh, rehab rehabilitate, and release uh, covered seabirds regardless of the source of mortality. Uh, and that funding uh, will increase uh, under the HCP, uh, starting at $300,000 uh, per year and then increasing uh, gradually over time uh, to adjust for inflation. Next slide. Um, now to the conservation sites. Um, we mentioned earlier the 10 conservation sites, um, including uh, site 10. And this uh, matrix shows the various measures that would be uh, implemented uh, within each of them. Uh, many of these are already happening and have they have been ongoing um, for several years. Um, whether it's uh, in a, two of the sites, um, a new uh, predator exclusion fence uh, would be constructed and maintained. Um, at three of the sites, it already exists and will be continued uh, to be maintained. Uh, there'll be mammalian predator control um, happening um, at all of the sites without uh, the predator-proof fencing. Um, and then if there's an incursion, of course, um, immediate predator control would occur um, if there's damage to those fences, for example. Um, barn owl control would occur everywhere uh, since, of course, those are flying predators. Uh, and then vegetation management uh, would occur at four sites um, and at the rest of the sites, the other six sites on an as-needed basis. The site pictured, by the way, on the photo is um, from a helicopter, and that is uh, the Poakea predator-proof fence. Uh, Loyal, I see your hand up. Yeah, what's the total number of acres that are going to be fenced? That we may have to get back to you on. I don't have that off the top of my head unless somebody else does. That number is in the HCB document, but I... I... So you will see that. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. You have a question. I, so uh, me as well would like to know the acreage of these units. Um, and then I, I recognize it's probably outlined, but the who is doing the management actions and how is that defined? Yeah, there's I can, a lot of Sorry. Go I ahead, can Don. I can sort of rough ball with Andre's assistance. Um, the the acreage of predator exclusion fences that we know today. Um Pohake is roughly one acre, is that right, Andre? And Hanapu is also roughly the ungulate fence, I don't know acreage on the ungulate fence, but the predator exclusion fence is also roughly one acre. Do you know the ungulate fence, Andre, at, at Honapu? No, I, I don't have those numbers to um, to mind, sorry. And the, the planned uh, upper Limahuli predator exclusion fence, we're still figuring out acreage on that. So I, I can't, we're figuring out final alignment. Um, so I can't give you an estimated acreage on that. And obviously site 10, we've yet to identify. So that's to be determined. Um, in terms of, of who's doing the management actions, um, ARC, Andre's team uh, is doing the colony monitoring at all of the sites. Uh, Halex, Kyle, I believe is with us today from Halex. Um, they are doing the predator control on all of the sites except Upper Lima Huli Preserve and NTBG has a team uh, internal to, to their staff that does the predator control at Upper Lima Huli. Vegetation management is um, uh, Koke Research Conservation Program. And um, the fence maintenance, uh, fence 
checks and fence maintenance and fence construction are Pono Pacific. Loyal, did you still have a question? Your hands up. No, I just forgot to put it down. Okay. Okay, next slide. All right, so now we're going to get into the um, population dynamics model, but I wanted to start with a few introductory slides uh, to kind of set it up for you and explain um, how we developed it, why we developed it, what it's being used for, um, and then we'll get into the results because I know you're you're anxious to see those. Um, so the goal goals with the model are to evaluate uh, the effects of the requested take authorization um, without mitigation. It helps to understand uh, what the effects of the taking will be and therefore um, what we need to do to offset those effects of the taking. Uh, we also wanted to quantify the benefits of the conservation measures um, and determine the net effects on, on the Kauai meta population of each species um, under the HCP. Um, we did develop separate models for Newell Shearwater and Hawaiian Petrel, um, although not for uh, Ban Rump Storm Petrel uh, due to the lack of data. Um, the models are spatially explicit. Uh, so if uh, Tori can uh, just click one more time, we'll show you the map on this slide where we've identified 15 distinct uh, subpopulations. Um, 10 of those are the conservation sites. Each conservation site is identified as its own subpopulation uh, because each has somewhat different um, behavior. Uh, and then for the rest of the island, uh, we divided it into five what we call unmanaged areas. Um, so these are uh, large parts of Kauai where we know uh, the covered seabird species occur, uh, but where um, management is very limited or non-existent in part because of inaccessibility uh, or uh, private land ownership uh, where uh, there's just no management occurring. Um, on the, and I'll just run through them really quickly. Uh, the Nepali coast, you can see there in the uh, orange is, is one. Um, Kalalau East to Upper Manoa is in the light green. And those are the areas um, in uh, the Northern part of the island outside of the conservation sites. Uh, we have the Wainiha and Lumahai Valleys in green. Um, and Waimea Canyon in brown. And then the largest area by far, uh, we call um, Hanale to Kakaha or Kakaha to Hanale, uh, both ways um, in the rest of the island. And overlaid there, you can see KIUC's transmission lines and the black lines, um, as well as the sources of light attraction um, in red. And the reason we came up with these different um, five unmanaged areas is because they differ uh, in their relative um, sources of mortality, um, as well as uh, different kinds of data available uh, with which to uh, determine uh, assumptions of initial abundance. So uh, with that, on the last major bullet there, of course, we have to start a model with a number. Uh, where are the populations of each of these species beginning um, in these model runs? Um, we don't have a population estimate uh, for the entire island. Uh, there are published estimates of the populations of these species at sea. Uh, but as we describe in the HCP, we found them to have very serious limitations that really precluded us from using them um, to come up with um, initial abundance estimates on land. Uh, and so we chose um, not to use those. Um, and instead, uh, based uh, the initial abundance on available data within each of the 15 subpopulations. And why don't we go to the next slide and we'll start to uh, explain that. So this is the same map and just explaining um, the data sources that were used for uh, the initial population estimate. 
um, that our team came up with. At the conservation sites, uh, you can imagine we have actually pretty good data for um, initial population sizes, um, nesting densities from burrow monitoring, um, auditory surveys of bird calls, um, as well as um, habitat suitability models, um, all of which could be used uh, to come up with um, uh, reasonable estimates of initial population size uh, within each conservation site. Um, within the Nepali coast, um, there are um, song meters um, deployed that can measure uh, calls and that are correlated with uh, numbers of individuals. Um, at Wainiha and Lumahai Valleys, uh, we used uh, nesting density estimates from auditory surveys combined uh, with uh, the habitat suitability model. Uh, same with uh, Kalalau East to Upper Manoa. Um, and in Hanalei Kakaha and in Waimea Canyon, uh, we had uh, radar trend data um, that uh, span um, almost 20 years, um, as well as uh, strike estimates uh, for uh, the more recent period. So uh, you can see the different data sources here um, that we've used to uh, estimate initial population sizes. Next slide. And then just a little bit more about some of these um, data sources. Andre can certainly explain uh, a lot more about each of these, um, but we uh, thought you might be interested in this. Um, the uh, borough monitoring um, and acoustic data has been uh, going on for over 10 years. Um, the uh, published habitat suitability model from 2014, which is shown uh, in the figure on the right, has been updated uh, recently. Uh, and of course, some of the conservation sites are new um, and start um, at zero or at a very low number. Um, for the five uh, larger unmanaged sites, um, the estimates of initial uh, breeding pairs uh, come from that combination of data, whether it's acoustic data for uh, the Nepali coast uh, or combined with uh, the published suitability model as well as radar uh, survey trends since 1993 um, in Hanalei de Kakaha and uh, Waimea Canyon. Next slide. And then finally, just um, sort of showing you um, all of that in, in one table, um, explaining the, the differences in relative mortality by source uh, for each of uh, the subpopulations, where uh, in the 10 conservation sites, uh, the relative mortality is uh, low for power lines, light attraction, and predation. Um, that's why we chose those 10 conservation sites to be located in that area because they're farthest from um, the power lines and the light attraction sources. Uh, and they are areas where we can uh, minimize and control uh, predation or eliminate it altogether in the case of the predator exclusion fencing. So we have a relatively high certainty uh, for the abundance estimates um, in those areas as a result. And then I won't walk you through each of these, but you can see the, the differences um, amongst um, each of the other uh, five unmanaged areas. Next slide. Okay, so this starts to get us into some of the details of the population dynamics model. We have an entire technical appendix uh, in the HCP, one each for uh, Newell Shearwater and Hawaiian Petrel um, that explains um, the construction of this model and all of the assumptions and parameters that were used um, for the model. Uh, it is a, a pretty standard age structured model, uh, otherwise known as a Lefkovich matrix. Um, we have uh, used assumptions based on what we believe are the best available data from Kauai, including uh, the long-term monitoring studies at the conservation sites that we've been referencing. Uh, where that was unavailable for certain um, demographic parameters, we used uh, numbers from published studies from uh, similar species elsewhere. 
So the model uh, inputs are parameters such as survival rate at each age, um, predation mortality rate at each age, power line mortality rates at each age, um, fertility rate starting at age six, uh, which is the um, reproductive age for, uh, for newell shearwater, and then the sex ratio, uh, which um, I believe we're assuming is 50-50. Is um, and these parameters, some of these parameters um, do vary by geographic subpopulation. So this is essentially 15 um, different sets of parameters um, fed into the same model with assumptions for uh, exchange of individuals uh, between subpopulations. Next slide. So here we have some results uh, from the model. Uh, this is for Newell Shearwater, and it's showing the uh, population uh, breeding pair abundance um, at all conservation sites combined, so all 10 sites, uh, both with the HCP in the blue line and without the HCP in the red line. So the red line is indicating what would happen if there was no power line minimization and no mitigation. So if we essentially walked away from the conservation site, stopped predator control um, and uh, deconstructed the, the fencing um, and what would happen without that. So um, the blue line is with uh, power line minimization, with uh, predator control um, and with, with mitigation. And you can see that the, uh, 10 subpopulations uh, combined uh, do increase considerably um, over time and uh, about halfway through the permit term, uh, which you can see indicated on the two vertical dash lines, um, will cross that uh, magic threshold of uh, 2,500 breeding uh, pairs um, and continue growing uh, from there. Next slide. Oh, sorry, before you go, looks like Loyal has a question. Yeah, so I mean, this next question is a hard question when you have a project that is already implemented and on the ground and you're doing an after the fact HCP like this one. So do you have an estimate of what the population would be doing if you did not have um, KIUC lines and lights? We do, that's coming up in a couple of slides. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, this is the result for Hawaiian petrol, uh, same parameters here. Uh, so this is at all 10 of the conservation sites combined. Uh, the red line being uh, without the HCP, so uh, take continues without minimization. Um, the mit mitigation stops at those conservation sites, and no surprise, uh, there's a significant decline. Um, and with minimization, uh, with mitigation, uh, the populations uh, increase or subpopulations increase and much sooner in the permit term are expected to cross that uh, 2,500 breeding pair um, threshold and continue to grow uh, from there. Next slide. So now we can look at the uh, meta population on the entire island. So beyond the 10 conservation sites, uh, we can look at all uh, of the 15 subpopulations. So we'll, we're including the five unmanaged areas as well uh, to see what um, the net effect may be um, on the, uh, the island. Now, this purple line, and I'm going to overlay four different lines here. So bear with me as I explain them and uh, overlay them. Um, this first line is indicating a hypothetical situation um, without pair power lines and without lights. So this is a case where there would be no take uh, from KIUC activities because the facilities uh, would be gone. Um, now, this is only looking forward. It's not looking back. So we're not 
answering the question, what if they never occurred? We don't know that answer. Loyal, that may have been what you were asking, but we can at least look forward uh, to what if um, all of those um, facilities were gone. Um, and the reason that the line um, continues to go down is because um, the effects of uh, predation um, really outweigh um, the effects of um, the power line strikes and, and light attraction. The, the effects of predation are um, still very significant and without active predator management, um, at least the model as we've defined it, um, predicts that the uh, meta population on the island would continue to decline. So click through one more, Tori. And now we can look at um, the situation in the red line of unminimized take. So this is the case similar to what we looked at before, uh, where the uh, KIUC facilities do exist and take um, is continuing, but uh, there's no minimization and there's no mitigation. So no surprise, it's a pretty dire uh, scenario. Um, the island-wide meta population declines pretty precipitously. Um, with take continuing, but without minimization and without mitigation. The gray line here um, is a helpful reference because it shows the benefits of minimization. So we can compare the red and the gray lines uh, and ask the question, what is the benefit of uh, power line minimization? And so as you would expect, uh, there does continue to be a decline because we're not doing mi mitigation. We're not doing predator control at the conservation sites, but we are doing power line minimization. Uh, and so it's a somewhat of an improvement over the red line. And then one more click, we can look at the proposed AHCP. Uh, and this is when we're combining uh, minimization and mitigation. Um, so we've, we're getting the full benefits of uh, population growth in the 10 conservation sites. And over time, um, that is going to result, according to the model, in a stabilization um, midway through the permit term, sort of in the latter third of the permit term um, of the MENA population on the island, and then um, starting to see growth of the MENA population where essentially we have um, the growth in the conservation sites um, dominating uh, the, uh, the model um, as uh, individuals uh, in the rest of the island that are unmanaged um, start to decline. And then one more click just for reference, I won't go through these, but it just shows you the kinds of comparisons that you can make. Um, to look at minimization effectiveness, effect of the proposed take, effect of the conservation strategy, and net effects. So based on these graphs, um, we do believe that um, the HCP uh, provides um, a net benefit for new old shear water uh, because of the uh, island-wide uh, population increase that we're seeing near the end of the permit term and the improvement uh, in the population uh, relative to uh, that hypothetical scenario where uh, no take is occurring at all. Next slide. And I'll go through this one faster because now you've been through uh, the first one, uh, but this is the result for Hawaiian Petrol. Our um, hypothetical um, no-take uh, scenario uh, shows um, a decline uh, without any predator control and without uh, take from power line or lights. Unminimized take uh, is worse. And then we see the gray line with proposed take uh, where we're minimizing uh, the take, but uh, not providing mitigation. And then finally, the blue line is showing uh, with mitigation and minimization. Um, and we see the blue line crossing the purple line much earlier in the permit term for Hawaiian petrol than we do for Newell Shearwater. Uh, but we're not getting that upturn near the end of the permit term. Um, 
because uh, the population growth rate is um, not nearly as dramatic as it is for new old shear water in the conservation site. So it just takes longer for um, that island-wide metapopulation uh, to, to see an upturn. Uh, we would see that if you extended this line beyond the permit endpoint of uh, 2073. All right, next slide. So certainly this is a model and we know that uh, all models are wrong, but some models are, are useful. Uh, and we acknowledge uh, in the HCP in a lot of places that uh, there is uncertainty uh, in the model assumptions and in the model results. Um, however, we do believe that many of the assumptions we selected are conservative, in other words, um, overestimating the effects and underestimating the benefits. Um, these are some examples here that we describe uh, in the conservation strategy um, and in the technical appendix uh, in some detail. Um, the breeding pair estimates that we used at the conservation sites, the initial breeding pair estimates uh, were minimums. Um, we used maximum uh, estimated uh, power line collision grounding rates. Um, we also used the maximum rate of decline uh, that has been estimated from uh, radar sites in the largest area and also used a, a very low maximum growth ceiling. In other words, uh, limiting the, the fastest these populations could grow um, to 2% per year in, uh, uh, in both species. And then finally, um, this model um, only assumes the benefits from these two HCPs um, to both species. So um, of course it assumes the benefits of the KIUC conservation sites and then adds in the one conservation site uh, from the Kauai Seabird HCP, assuming the benefits of that HCP are realized. We know there are other conservation efforts around the island. Uh, there are likely to be more in the future, um, but we do not assume any of those additional benefits in this model when taking into account um, island-wide uh, population trends. So despite all that, uh, we certainly want, uh, and we believe that we've designed a fairly robust um, monitoring and adaptive management program uh, to monitor outcomes, um, actual outcomes against expected outcomes and have um, a, a pretty extensive set of triggers, many of which are quantitative triggers uh, to ensure that um, the agencies and KIUC take a really close look at what's happening and take action if needed to adjust performance. So I think Melissa has a question. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, did I time it right? Are you actually ready for questions? <laughs> yes, great timing, good okay. job. Okay, so um, I appreciate your efforts to put together models in a situation where there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, I think what made me a little concerned is that in a situation where there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and even when there's not, I'm used to models showing me the confidence intervals so that I understand, particularly in a situation where we're looking decades out before those lines either start to go up or flatten out, um, which means you've got a long period of time where things continue to go down and it's hard to um, get a feel for, is it working? And obviously you're gonna be coming back and reporting out to our committee, is this working? And we're gonna be evaluating, is this working? And so I think it's especially important that whenever you present these graphs, you're presenting them with the confidence intervals shown. And I know it's messy because you've got, you know, all those different lines are showing, but particularly for the line with mitigation, which is the final one we're interested in, I'd really like to see those confidence intervals shown so we can get a, feel for things. I guess what I've been spending a lot of time looking at is um, the fact that, uh, like, for example, with climate change, we're under worst case scenarios. <laughs> if you look at what we thought was going to happen 50 years ago to species, all their trajectories are on the bottom end of what you would expect when you're predicting out. And so I like to see worst case scenarios now and assume that those 
can happen. <laughs> and as a person who's a diehard optimist, or I wouldn't be in this field, not just look at the most likely or the high end, you know, optimistic view, because I, unfortunately, I think there's so much complication. Worst case scenarios are entirely possible. So in your future times of presenting to us, can you make sure and include those confidence intervals on the graph so we can consider those? Thanks, Melissa. I'm going to turn, turn it over to John Brandon to respond to that regarding confidence intervals. Yeah, hi, Melissa. Um, so and so for, for everyone else, um, I, I'm the one that's uh, been working on this, this model in collaboration with um, Andre and Mark Travers and um, and others here. Um, so I'll do my best. I'll, I'll be leaning on Andre a lot uh, to answer any questions model related because uh, this is really just a, an attempt to try and synthesize a lot of new data I think that's been collected in the last 10 years or so. Um, I would, um, I, your, your point is well taken. Um, and what we have tried to do, um, I think is mentioned in a, an earlier slide in terms of uncertainty here is to um, make, uh, to, to always go with um, conservative assumptions. Um, so for example, um, Andre has breeding pair estimates from the conservation sites. We take the lower of uh, the range, um, the lower number of those estimates. So in that respect, um, you can think of the lines that we were just looking at as um, our attempt to show the lower 95th percentiles, um, not to use an exact number, but um, these would these would be on the low side, I think, of um, the uncertainty bands. Um, in terms of things like climate change, um, I think that might be a little bit outside the scope of an HCP. I'm not an HCP expert. David could address something like that, but... Um, yeah, apologies. I wasn't asking for climate change models. I was just saying that um, like when you run PVAs or population dynamic models, typically you're, you have some element of stochasticity built into the model and you're running it with a hundred iterations or a thousand iterations or something like that to um, build in that stochasticity. And so you're not getting a single number out of that model. I assume you didn't just run it once. You, you typically run it with you know some number of iterations. And so you should get a confidence, confidence band when you run that. So you're telling me you use the worst case scenario inputs and I appreciate that. But I also wanna see with stochasticity built in you know, what's the actual worst case scenario within that model for, for where it actually makes that turn from, from going down to going up or leveling out? Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Andre. Um, yeah, so um, as another example, just to give you a little bit more flavor, um, I mentioned um, that we use the as an example the lower of the two numbers for the breeding pair estimates from the conservation sites um, for the for the radar trend data. And if people aren't aren't, aren't familiar with that, um, this is the longest term uh, monitoring survey on Kauai. I think it actually goes back to 1993, so 30 years. Um, and we take the so in that that's another example where we. We there are multiple sites. I think Andre will correct me, thirteen or something like that um, around the island. And the the most drastic rate of decline is from the Hanalei radar site, and that's um, been about ten or eleven percent per year rate of decline on average across all those sites. The rate of decline is uh, has been over that time period about uh, it's negative six point nine percent, I believe. So we use for that big Hanalei to Keikaha area, we we use the negative um, eleven percent rate of decline instead of the six point nine percent. And so, um, in terms of stochasticity, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, as David mentioned, this is not meant to be a, a PVA. Um, I would think that it's best thought of as something of a, a yardstick. Um, so when Andre is out or, or whoever Andre's successor is and <laughs> at the end of this, um, right? Um, there there are um, some, an ability to say, okay, are, are we meeting, you know, to, to get to that level of 
recovery. Um, have we have we crossed this Rubicon here um, or not? You know, if we're we're above a certain number of breeding pairs in the conservation sites, then that's good. And if not, then um, then I, I would think that that's when adaptive triggers and the such come in. Just for clarification, you're telling me that there really aren't confidence intervals that are produced as a part of producing these models. Well, there aren't confidence intervals in some of these, in some of the um, estimates that go into the model. So the model itself needs the inputs to have um, st statistical measures of uncertainty to Otherwise, I mean, I could make something up and we, we can make some informed um, guesses about um, what the stochasticity is around the maximum rate of growth or natural mortality or what have you. Um, we, in a lot of cases, um, those are not necessarily available, at least not for, and certainly not for all of the, the um, parameters that, that go into a population dynamics model. So we, we are trying to synthesize all the data that's available, but in some cases it's it's not there. We do take into account the um, confidence intervals around the radar trend. So whenever possible, we do. Um, but no, the model itself is deterministic right now. Uh, David, I think you, unless Melissa, you had any follow-ups. Um... Okay, thanks, David. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, uh, several comments. Sorry, um, but this is there's a lot in here. Um, sort of last in, first out. Um, John, you said that an HCP analysis doesn't need to take into account climate change. Um, I guess we, our we, comment. <laughs> yeah, we we do we do later. We just do it in a different way. So we'll we'll get okay. to that. Good, excellent, yeah. because it's a 50-year HCP, and um, yeah, there's going to be climate change, and and we need to take that into account. Good. I'm glad we're on the same page. Um, <clears throat> there was also a statement um, in the slides and in the discussion that it is a conservative assumption uh, to ignore the benefits from other HCPs other than the island-wide HCP and the KIUC HCP. Uh, I'd like to push back on that. Um, if you put up the slide about Newell Shearwater Population Dynamics Model, um, and you have the no-take hypothetical in which there's no power lines or lights, um, that that purple curve, um, it's clearest with the Shearwater, sure, sure, thank you, that's a good one. Um, so if you're ignoring, you're assuming the world as it is today, with no H, no KIUC and everything else, uh, ignoring the fact that there are other sources of take other than the light attraction that uh, the, from the few participants of the island-wide HCP. It's island. It's called island-wide, but it's not. It doesn't get everyone. Um, so there are other sources of take on the island of people who are currently violating the ESA because they don't have an HCP and they're not mitigating and minimizing their take. And that's what your purple line says. So if other parties get their acts together and comply with the ESA, that purple line decline will not be as steep because sources of existing take that are not being minimized and mitigated will be minimized and mitigated, which means that purple line is going to have a different slope. And you may not have a net conservation benefit because you're counting on it in the late 2060s. Uh, on the assumption that everyone's going to sit on their hands, there's not going to be any enforcement, there's not going to be compliance, and um, and that includes future projects, presumably. Uh, I don't think that's a conservative assumption. I think that's one that benefits KIUC. It assumes that other people aren't going to have to uh, do predator control. Other people aren't going to have to minimize their take. That's why your line looks like that. So, well, to respond on in one way to that, I think in your uh, hypothetical example, if more people came into compliance and minimized their take, they would also be providing more mitigation. And so I think what would happen is both lines would start to go up, both the purple line and the blue line. Because remember, the blue line is meant to be a representation of 
the entire island-wide meta population. All we're assuming right now for benefits is the Kauai Seabird HCP and the KIUC HCP. So if there were more HCPs, that would be a good thing. We would we would welcome that uh, because that take from other uh, sources of mortality, as you point out, would go down and mitigation would go up. And so both lines uh, would presumably go up and, and we believe um, the net benefits would be uh, very similar to what we're showing here. Okay, so I guess what you're saying, and I'll have to think about it more, is it's not a conservative assumption. It's just, um, it's it's neutral either way. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I could see your point. I, I don't think it's very likely that we're going to have um, a lot of new HCPs popping up from um, commercial and residential light sources. Uh, yeah. But uh, there certainly is going to be more conservation done outside of the regulatory process of the ESA. Um, we know that's occurring now. For example, uh, the military is doing mitigation on their own, although that is a regulatory context. That is not built into this. Uh, we don't account for the benefits of their actions. The state is likely to continue benefits uh, out, again, outside of the context of HCPs. Those are not accounted for. So uh, I do think it is somewhat conservative. We could argue about the, the relative nature of the conservative assumption, um, but it, it's, all, it's all somewhat speculative. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll meditate on that. I hope you will as well. Um, sure. Uh, staying with this graph, the um, you get to a net conservation benefit because you assume that half of the uh, Newell shear waters that are down by light attraction don't die. Um, and as we've discussed, that's not, in our view and in, in the view of some of the members of the ESRC at least, that's not accurate. They probably all die or nearly all die. And you've also ignored adult mortality. Uh, in terms of light attraction. So that's how you get to net conservation benefit in 2020, in, in 2067. I would caution you, um, it's not quite that simple. If you recall from the um, earlier table on the initial abundance for the Hanalei to Keikaha area where um, I believe fallout would be uh, where, where most of the fallout would happen if, if um, and and certainly where where most of the power line collisions happen. Um, the way that this model works um, is we take the trend from the radar data, which is is data. It is what it is. It's that negative. We assume it's the negative 11% rate of decline from the Hanalei radar site that I mentioned. We take the um, mortality estimate, the anthropogenic mortality estimate from the power line um, collision estimate. And given um, the low maximum rate of population growth that we're assuming conserve. Um, you, you know, you might argue that's conservative or not. It can't be less than zero. Um, you can work out how many birds there would need to be to sustain sustain that level of mortality and um, be consistent with the observed data from the radar trends. So if you think of um, an example where you you have uh, I give you a problem um, that says you have a stock market account it's declined at ten percent in the last year and that's your radar trend and you lost ten dollars from that account that's your collision estimate or your fallout estimate you can work out how much money was in the account at the beginning of the year right that's like you had a hundred dollars if you um, change the assumption about how many birds are dying or the mortality from fallout or collisions, all else being equal, there have to be more birds there. So that's just to give you a little bit of flavor about the, the, the way that's working for that area. So there are some implicit assumptions um, that go into um, the level of mortalities that, that, are, that are being assumed. Um, so, like I said, just to caution you, it's not quite that simple 
um, in this model anyway. Okay, and, and <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Andre. Yeah, can I just, because uh, adult, um, the downing of adults by lights has come up a couple of times. Can I just make, make a couple of comments about that? Because it does seem to be relevant to the discussion. Um, you know, so fallout, as, as everyone knows, it's for seabirds being attracted to, to lights, and um, the majority of the fallout is uh, fledglings. Now, um, Melissa and David, you both have pointed out that adults do get grounded, um, but that is related. So, it's, and we have seen that. So, we saw a mass fallout event at Koke Air Force Station in 2015. Um, those are all adults, and the majority of those are breeding adults, um, as evidenced by brood patches. Um, but that was a very unique scenario where it was very bright lights from the Air Force Station um, adjacent to colonies. Um, on, on Kauai as a whole, every year when we see fallout happening, um, and that's through birds being collected and by ourselves and, and ge the general public, I'm going to hand over to SOS. Um, <clears throat> the vast majority of that fallout, and it, it is mainly newels, is juveniles, fledglings mm -hmm. um, during the fallout season. Uh, we do get some birds which are adults in inverted commas, and that typically is at the beginning of the year um, when birds are coming back. Um, our speculation of that is that those are birds returning for the first time um, because it's a very much a, a, a sort of discrete period of time where it's the beginning of the season. And we don't see any further adult fallout um, up until the point, any fallout after that period of time until we get to the fledging season. So I think, um, you know, if, if KC had bright lights up near colonies, um, then I think we could be, you know, we, we would definitely need to think about adult fallout as being part and parcel of fallout itself. But when you're considering light attraction down in the cities from street lights and, um, and the facilities themselves, you know, I, I would say the vast, vast, vast majority of that is not related to breeding adults at all. It is, it is fledglings. So just wanted to raise that because it has been something which has been talked about a couple of times so far today. Okay, so uh, Andre, there you're uh, addressing the issue that there's uh, an estimate of zero indirect take of eggs and chicks. So your your assumption is, uh, based on the the data you're talking about, is adults can come down, they do come down, but they they haven't bred yet. Right. Yeah. I mean that 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 seems to us to be the case from watching this happen over the last ten years is that there's this pulse of the adults and and by pulse I mean it's like a couple of birds. Yeah. It's very much sure. at the beginning of the season, and I feel like if it's a breeding adult thing, you'd be seeing adults peppered throughout the season, um, whereas it's not. It's just a, a couple of birds at the very beginning of the year, then nothing, and then of course the big fallout um, period um, so once okay. you get to the end of September, beginning of October. Got it. Okay. Um... So in, in, in your, your memory, in that, in that later period of time where we might be seeing breeding adults, uh, uh, we're, we're, well, in that later period of time where breeding has occurred and there might be chicks in the den, you're saying that adults don't come down. There's no data indicating any adults come down during that later period after they've gone back to the nest at the beginning of the period. Right. When you, when you look at the uh, SOS birds and we look at adults that come in, because adults do come in throughout the year, right. um, yeah. it's, it's, they've always, it's related to power line collisions. Okay. Um, but back on this issue of, um, you know, when I was talking with John, it sounded like, and I haven't seen the model on, you know, I haven't reviewed the draft HCP. I don't, I'm not privy to it yet. Um, you know, I, I get that if the, the chart that we're looking at that, you know, some of these predictions have to do with the radar data and the radar data may be independent of the estimates of mortality set forth in the HCP. Uh, but I'm finding it hard to understand, and again, maybe when I read the HCP, it'll be evident, it seems to me that if you've got the mortality from light attraction wrong by half, that it wouldn't affect either the purple or the blue line, like, um, you know, your estimate of no take, which is an artificial world, which is totally modeled, because so you don't have any radar data for the purple line, the purple line is something that is based on assumptions about what the world would be like in the absence of KUC's operations, and again, what I'm saying is, if the number of mortalities from light is double, and then you take away that amount of mortality, that's got to affect the slope of the purple line. I just don't understand how it couldn't. So I, go, go ahead, Don. Oh, uh, this or is Tori. Tori. I just wanted to add that um, for the purposes of the model, and John, jump in here if I'm incorrect, but we assume 100% mortality. We break it down in the HCP between um, 
mortality and injury for the purposes of the Section 7 consultation that has to happen. But in the model, we assume the conservative assumption that 100% is mortality. John, correct me if that's wrong, but that's my understanding of what's in the model. Yeah, thanks, Tori. That's right. It's it's and it but it and it is um, fledglings. Fledglings, so, yes, correct. Yeah. Um, so it seems 100% mortality. So all 4,632 newel shear water reserves seem to be dead for purposes of the model. Over 50 years, right? I mean, I, I I'm sorry if I don't remember the exact number. It's uh, but it's something like 80. Tori can help me out here. About 80 per year, uh, 80 fledglings per year die in that Honolulu K Kaha area is the assumption. Yeah, it's scaled up each year. Okay. All Not right. all in year one. Okay. And then, um, da yeah. So, David, too, the um, the the purple line there. I think um, you mentioned some assumptions. Um, just to point out, uh, the that that no take purple line. So the the reason it's declining is predation only. Those are, that's from um, so no in this hypothetical world um, there are. Uh, no mortalities from power lines, just introduce predators. The um, now we're not making up a number for that. That those we have predation rates from from Andre and from the conservation sites, and so um, prior to dedicated predator control measures there. So we um, the assumption that's made in that purple line is that those predation rates without dedicated predator control apply island wide, and that's the rate of decline that that would result. Um, from that. So okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, uh, going, I'm sort of going last anyway. Um, there was a discussion of uh, streetlight modifications, and and uh, that the all the streetlights have or will be shielded, and that with respect to the facility lights, they're going to be dimmed during the fallout season. Uh, I didn't hear anything about dimming streetlights. During the fallout season, um, you may be aware, you may not be aware that pursuant to a settlement agreement uh, with the county of Maui, uh, they did dim uh, their streetlights during the fallout season. Um, and I'm wondering, um, so first question is whether as a form of minimization, um, there's any consideration to dimming the streetlights. I think we talk, I think somewhere later in the presentation, there's something about minimization of streetlights, but um, I'll, I'll just, because this is, I think, the second question we've had on this. So the situation with the streetlights is they're ordered by the county and they're installed by KIUC. So can't count the county, I'm aware of the situation on Maui. Um, that's a, that would have to be a county action, so it would not be a minimization implemented by KIUC. Um, we are working with county. Um, it, you know, if the county does do a countywide um, type of uh, lighting ordinance similar to what's happened uh, on Maui, that you know we would certainly. Um, that would certainly get incorporated with streetlight operations. But that, again, that's not a KIUC decision. What KIUC can do is, um, you know, work with the county to see what potential minimization options can be implemented that do not impact um, public safety is the biggest one, of course, on people's minds. Um, and, and that's been an ongoing conversation that will continue. So um, right now, the minimization does not involve dimming of street lights, but, but dimming of the facility lights. And just a clarification, the shielding has already occurred. That's, that's, a, that's in place now. And the dimming started at the facilities in 2019. Okay. And um, yeah, I guess I, I'm assuming your answer is going to be the same with respect to- uh, sorry, uh, sorry, David, uh, can I cut you off? Um, I, we need no. to make sure that ESRC members um, have their question answered first, and then we can go back to you. Um, Lodell, can you um, ask your question next? Sorry, Lane, did you say to designate me or somebody yeah. else? I couldn't write Yeah, I think yeah. you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Um, David, had 
good questions. So I was enjoying listening to that too. So I just have a couple of things here. One, um, do you know what, let's see, since we got this graph up, I'll use it first. First question is, you know, it's really nice on your um, blue graph, the proposed HCP minimization and mitigation. I know you combine the two HCPs, but from a technical perspective, I think we're going to be looking at the impact of this HCP kind of by itself. So I mean, I think you should keep this line somewhere and have it because it's good to know how the two of them uh, benefit uh, the birds. But having it just for KAC alone would be probably more germane to the point to task. But again, I like this from the outside. This is the kind of graphs that I, I do like to see, notwithstanding some of the potential questions as to how the take is done. And I, but I do think you might want to look at trying to throw some stochasticity into the, into these graphs rather than straight deterministic, particularly with respect to say breeding success, annual breeding success or something along that lines um, as a, as a comment. Another question is, what kind of density do you expect to be getting at your conservation areas of, you know, number of burrows per acre, for example? Yeah, thanks, Loyal. Uh, to your first question, actually, the Kauai Seabird HCP conservation site is part of the baseline in all of the lines. So the comparison among the lines is still valid and, and does examine the differences only with or without the KIUC HCP. So we're not mixing and match, matching scenarios there. Oh, uh, okay, that's good, but you should make that point so you know that for all the other lines, because that wasn't clear to me on that. So good, right. thanks. Yeah, no, um, thank you for, for clarifying that. I'll, um, I'll let John and Andre talk about the density of burrows at the, the conservation <laughs> sites. Hey, Lyle. Um, for, for the density of birds at the conservation sites, what we've been using is um, the nearest neighbor distances um, within the colonies as the colonies grow. Um, and that's what we use for um, creating our population estimates. So, you know, we know that um, that birds, seabirds, mules, and uh, well, any, any shearwaters and, and petrels, they can nest in high density if uh, the conditions are right for them. Um, and so when we're creating our population estimates, we we're basing outside of the social attraction sites, we're basing our population estimates on the known nearest neighbor distances as the colonies increase in size. So that's all burrows that we're monitoring outside of ones outside of ones that are very far away. Um, the nearest average nearest na neighbor distance between each of those burrows. And then in the social attraction site, um, I can't remember exactly what we use for our spacing, but we based our spacing on um, the placement of our nest boxes and a buffer around each nest box um, to create uh, a density within the site. And that created a carrying capacity within each of our social traction sites. It'd be good to know what that is because uh, that's going to, uh, it'd be nice to know what that is. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can get it for you. I can look it up yeah. while everyone else is talking. Great. Um, we're presumably going to get to triggers later. But are they going to be hard triggers or are they going to be soft triggers when we get to whether or not you're meeting your expectations? And this isn't for Andre per se, it's more for um, the folks that are actually talking about the HCPs. We don't have to do that now if you're going to talk triggers later. But just I was just wanting to know whether you're making hard or soft triggers. And then my last comment is uh, these graphs like this will go over the span of the HCP are really good. I'd really like to see one that shows, um, you know, say starting what you think the population number is uh, for um, these areas or all the areas combined, starting from say like 2000 all the way through 2070, what you think the population has done. And then for the HCP, you know, the, the take levels along those years as well, and juxtaposition with those, the number of birds that are expected to be produced each year. So that you can see how the take is uh, annually each year over the 50 years plus uh, historical numbers um, and see how that is changing over time, particularly in comparison to how your mitigation efforts are going to be 
you know, increasing the populations in your 10 conservation units. So something along that line would really help give historical perspective and at the same time see what the impact and the speed of impact for the HCP is. Thanks. I'll raise my, lower my hand now. Thanks, Loyal. We do actually have uh, the data you're talking about into the future in the HCP technical appendix. So we have um, a table, in fact, that, that has predicted numbers um, at five-year intervals, both for uh, mitigation for the conservation sites, um, as well as the estimated power line strikes at, at all those intervals. So you can start to see um, the, the changes uh, in all of those factors um, as, as things progress. Um, I think it would be harder for us to go back to 2000. And, and honestly, um, um, I think that's not necessarily the purpose of this HCP. You know, the take permit applies only into the future. Um, so we're not, uh, we're not revisiting the past or trying to estimate um, what happened 20 years ago. Also, you can see many of our data sets don't go back that far. Um, only the radar data go back 30 years um, and um, some of the monitoring data, maybe 20 years, uh, power line monitoring, 10 years. So we're, we're definitely more limited in, in going back in time. Yeah, I know you'll be more limited, but you know, to be honest, I mean, this has been a long time coming, right? This, this um, HCP. So there is gonna be a desire to see how, what that 20 years of prep time to come up with an HCP um, is going to get us and how it really looks into the historic perspective. I understand, you know, the legal aspects of HCPs reasonably well, but having that sort of historical perspective will look, will give us a view of what is actually being done by KIUC, when it's being done and how it's going to relate into not only the past, but into the future to see how um, these bird populations are going to turn out. Okay, thanks for that comment. Uh, David, Lisa, I think you're next. Sorry, before, sorry, Lisa, oh, before, I just wanted to um, respond to Loyal's original question. I've just looked it up. Um, for the social attraction sites, we created a buffer around the interior of the um, site so that the birds weren't breeding right next to the fences, which obviously they wouldn't do. Um, and then we made a spacing of, I, I believe it was three meters between each nest box to come up with a carrying capacity and density within the site. Great, thanks, Andre. Lisa, go ahead. So I think Andre kind of might have answered where I was getting at. I just coming from the perspective of the challenge of managing conservation units over a long-term period, um, and seeing over years of experience waxing and waning of management effort. Um, I guess from my perspective, seeing all those units kind of clustered in one part of the island, um, the concern being that, you know, is it realistic to have all of these projected breeding pairs be able to fit <laughs> within those units, which I think Andre got at. But also the concern, I think the Hanalei Keikaha section is what worries me in that there is no conservation units or efforts unless, you know, on a bigger picture unrelated to this HCP, there maybe are that, you know, but just from looking at the units and the concentration in one part of the island, I'd be worried if there was a catastrophic event like a hurricane, um, that the likelihood of recovery of the birds is reduced if there isn't a, a more island-wide view of trying to save or protect units elsewhere as well. Yeah, great questions, Lisa. I'll turn it to Andre and Dawn because I think that does speak to the site selection process and why uh, we chose that, that northern coast of Kauai. Um, Dawn, shall I respond or did you want to respond first? Um, I'll just 
I think you probably have more detail, Andre, but I will just say that um, we, we were actually, um, we, we received agency guidance to focus conservation areas in that Northwest corner. Um, we know that there, there are less risk specific to power lines and light attraction in that Northwest corner. It's the darker part of the island, less developed. And in many respects, no development in some of those locations um, or very little. Um, so, so that was part of the guidance we received. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there, Andre, and turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, when I guess we're sort of we're also restricted by where um, the birds are, the remnant populations are, and you know, most of these birds now because of um, human impact are restricted to the northwest coast of the island, and that would be anywhere from the Nepali all the way up to, you know, Wainiha, Lumahai. And we have, like, over the years, um, surveyed all over this island looking for colonies. And when you look at sites on the east um, and the south of the island, where there are pockets of birds hanging on, um, the concept of doing management in those areas is pretty daunting um, in terms of, uh, you know, what you get out of it. So if you look at somewhere like the Kalaheo colony, which is a the Kalaheo Kahili colony, which is where there was a lot of um, monitoring work done in the 90s. I mean, that site used to be like Upper Lima Huli in terms of numbers. And now when you go up there, it's uh, quite a depressing place. It's, uh, you know, a ghost town um, with like maybe a dozen or two dozen pairs left just strung out over a vast area. When you think about trying to manage a site like that um, and whether you'd even be effective, um, there's, you know, people all over the place up there. There's predators everywhere. The habitat is heavily degraded. The birds have to cross multiple power lines to get up there. They've got the lights of Kalaheo and, um, you know, Hoipu further on down onto the coast. Um, you could you could try doing spending huge amounts of money to uh, manage those birds and probably still see those birds wink out over um, a 50 year period. Whereas the areas that we're concentrated on, um, you have a high chance of success because there are still a lot of birds, a, a shadow of what they used to be, but still a lot of birds up there. Um, the areas where they can be managed and the uh, um, power line collision and light attraction aspects are much diminished. So um, also, I, I would just add, like when you look at that map and you look at Kauai as a whole, it, it may look like it's a small area where everything's crammed in. But when you get down on the ground, I mean, it is a pretty large spot. So if you think about a hurricane hitting or large landslides, sure, I mean, that's definitely a concern. And we have seen large landslides um, when there was that rain bomb that went off in, I think it was 2018. Um, but you, you get an impact on one site, but not necessarily all the sites. Um, so I think as we start to look towards a new site for the area, we'd still want to concentrate in that in that sort of northwest quadrant, you know, because that is where the birds are and that's where their threats are most diminished and that's where management can be most effective. Mahalo. Hey, um, Tori, we've had a, a YouTube comment come in from a member of the public asking if we can switch to, what's the word of it? Uh, gallery view. The gallery view when people are talking. So if, if when we are having the back and forth comments and discussion, if we could stop sharing screen, then we can see the speakers. Oh, sure, no problem. I can definitely do that. I've, we were, in some cases, we've been looking at the slides a little bit while we've been discussing these things, but I can absolutely do that. Thank you. Yeah, stop sharing right question, now. My next question actually asks for looking at a slide. Okay, so. I'll keep it up <laughs> I'll stop Okay, okay. <laughs> Which slide did you want to look at, Melissa? Um, do you mind going back to the slide with the map that does show those different areas? And yes. I, just a final question. And if this was explained before, please forgive me. I'm trying to um, understand all of these pieces. When I when I think about that gigantic line continuing to go down for a long time, given the long reproduction and time to maturity times of these species. And so I'm assuming that those areas where there's not a lot of mitigation action taking place and they're really heavily impacted by lights and power lines still, is the model assuming those populations are gonna go ahead and decline to zero most likely while you get the growth occurring in the other areas? And again, I think this just gets to my need to understand the uncertainty around the models because I would expect that reproductive success 
mortality, all of those things are not going to be equal across your um, different colonies and the different parts of the island. So I'm wondering if you can just speak to how that's, those differences are built into the model and how, you know, if, if your population is declining in areas that are more heavily impacted by lice, does that mean your overall mortality decreases over time? Uh, just anyways, if you can help me out with understanding that, that would be great. Yeah, I can, um, I can start. And so you are, um, without having the benefit yet, Melissa, of, of seeing some other plots um, that are in the, the draft, um, you're spot on. So the Honolulu K Kaha area um, being most impacted um, in the model is declining. And so it is essentially um, weighing more, if you will, on the total abundance plots. Um, and where if, if you kind of compare those, you see very different trends um, in the in the total abundant or total abundance plots versus the conservation site plots, right? The conservation sites are going up, but the total abundance is going down for for a while. Um, and that again comes back to um, that large area not having management or predator control, et cetera. Um, so that that's essentially how this this model is working, yeah. Um, you know, I think um, this is in the the way that Andre can speak to the division of of the island into these areas, but um, you know, this 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 is um, this is it's part part of the re one of the reasons why I think um, you, you you know Andre kind of split things up this way and and why we're modeling it this way is because there are very different dy dynamics spatially depending on where where these birds are right so the like you said the the we expect that the survival rates are going to be a lot lower um, in that big area compared to the conservation sites um, the data are different. Um, for those areas too, um, we do make, um, yeah, so I, that that's kind of what's going on. All these areas have different trends and there's um, that one big area does weigh down pretty heavily on, on, on everywhere else, but the conservation sites we have, and we do have data um, that isn't, I don't think shown in, in these plots, but um, that Andre has, and he can speak to these as well too, that you know there are independent trend data outside of the radar data um, which is limited to the parts of the island that have roads, um, but there are there's acoustic monitoring happening in the conservation sites that's showing um, that those those areas have been increasing with with the conservation efforts that have been going on ongoing there for the better part of the last ten years or so. So different trends in different areas, and when you put them all together, you you end up with um, the the plot of total abundance that was shown. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Andre. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the population estimates um, came out of the need to to create new population estimates because, as we've seen from the at the the previous ones, which were based on at sea, um, the at there's a lot of limitations towards the at sea estimates because they're not covering many of the areas where the birds go, which um, has only recently been discovered due to to tracking work. So we realize that the at sea population estimates are are way too low, and it's also what we're seeing when we're out <clears throat> doing our surveys is that in some areas there are still a lot of birds and, and I'd like to say when when I use the word a lot of birds I mean there are a lot of birds but nothing like what they used to have been that's my little caveat there um, and so we're faced with a pretty daunting task of trying to create a population estimate based on um, data collected on land um, and so the way that we did that was create these I mean they're fairly crude um, di uh, divisions um, but they're based on multiple things and you can see there in that um, that box on the slide it's it's things like uh, levels of threat so the blue area Kakaha um, to Hanalei is the area which is heavily impacted by power line collisions and light attraction um, predators invasive plants so on and so forth um, and then you've got other areas like the conservation sites which are sort of the gold standard now and that they are still fairly intact populations with high levels of management you've got places like the Nepali um, where by terrain um, the newels are relatively protected by sheer cliff walls um, where some of the mammalian predators can't reach them. Same with Waimea Canyon. And then places like Waianiha and Lumahai, we have more information on what those birds are doing because we have done um, auditory surveys there in the past um, and even more recently, a couple of years ago. 
So we tried to sort of um, split the island up into as many subdivisions as we could comfortably use based on the data available and then use different techniques to come up with population sizes within those areas. So um, like one of the previous slides showed, you know, we used um, uh, within our conservation sites, we used uh, a combination of uh, auditory surveys and nearest neighbor distances based on burrows and uh, trend analyses because we you know, been following those sites for 10 years now. So we have a really good idea of where the birds are within those areas. And we have a, a good handle on what they're doing, which is a, a increasing population size over time. Um, whereas somewhere like the Nepali coast, where you can't even access the birds because they're in the top third of these sort of many thousand foot cliffs, we've been using song meters um, and a regression line based on the relationship between call rates and um, burrows um, on the ground around song meters. Um, so we've used different techniques to come up with population sizes within each of those areas. Um, and then we've combined them all um, to create uh, an island-wide population estimate. And I believe that the Excel file that we used to create this population estimates was shared with the USRC perhaps, um, which showed all of the working outs um, for how we came up with those population estimates. Yeah, thank you to both of you. Um, I think I'll let that gel for a while in my head. And then uh, I'm sure as we start thinking about how things, how we evaluate progress moving forward, particularly over the next 50 years, I'm gonna be really interested in seeing how those estimates are done moving forward and um, compared to expectations and, and how we collect those data to, to make those assessments. But I uh, appreciate both of your explanations. Thank you. Tori and David, I just, I need to interject here. Um, I'm getting some text requesting a break. I think we, we've been going for almost three hours. So I think we probably need to pause here and take a little break, give everybody a few minutes to um, take a bathroom break and, and come back. Sure. I, I, my, my additional comments were about two minutes worth, but before, after is fine. I think Don was referring to me, David. You can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was. And it's, if you've got, to, if it's literally two minutes, go for it. <laughs> I'll be, okay. We were just talking about street lights and street light modifications. I had mentioned dimming. The other thing I want to flag is um, wavelength of street light. Um, I believe Kauai uses a bright white street light. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, unlike Hawaii Island, which uses a uh, amber lower short wavelength uh, light. Uh, the new Maui County ordinance uh, requires uh, that co that Maui County is going to switch to a low blue light, uh, which benefits seabirds and uh, sea turtles. And I uh, assume your answer is going to be, well, that's really up to the county of Kauai. And yeah, but you're operating the street lights, they're your street lights. Um, and I believe DOFA waited on this when Maui County was uh, considering um adopting its ordinance. So anyhow, uh, you know, if you need me to show up at a, a meeting uh, with the county to talk about whether they want to change what they ask of KAUC, I'd be happy to show up at the meeting. But one way or another, we need to address um, the, the brightness and the, um, and the uh, spectrum of the streetlights. That was it. Okay, thanks for the comments. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? And we'll come back at five minutes after the top of the hour. Would it be possible? Are we going to do a lunch break? <laughs> I, I I can't eat in ten minutes. <laughs> so should we just should we should we just do a half hour then? Is that enough time, Melissa? If if we do half hour, or you want forty five minutes? Is that better? Thirty is plenty for me. I'll let others speak for themselves. <laughs> Okay, how about anybody speak up if half an hour is not enough? Okay. And can we just, and we're ending this at, at two, or is it go beyond that? I didn't see it on the agenda. My understanding is that we go until we're done, but I- Until we're done, okay. Over to Kate on that. Um, Kate? Yeah, we don't have an end time, although I did plan the Zoom until three. So I don't know if it'll end us at three. But um, <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't ever put end times on the agenda because we want to allow the, the committee to voice any comments that they have. 
Okay, great. That's helpful just for us to track. Thank you. Hey everyone, before we break for lunch, um, I just wanted to give you a heads up that I may not be able to come back for the afternoon session. Um, some of you may know that there's some things going on here at the office this week, and I'm trying desperately to multitask among a bunch of different competing priorities. I'm really sorry to miss it. This has been a good discussion. I'm very grateful for KAUC coming and presenting this information for us. And I, I feel like there's been a lot of um, really robust comments and uh, information flow today, which is the kind of ESRC meeting that I very much enjoy participating in. I will do my best to come back, but in case I don't, I will go back and watch the recording later and we'll check in with the other ESRC members about any follow-up items that we need to talk about. Thanks so much and really appreciate the time today. Thank you, Michelle. So let's just say um, returning at 1.30 then, that gives us 33 minutes. <laughs>
Tori, do you want to go ahead and put the presentation back up? Um, it's saying to me that host has has disabled sharing screens when I try to press this share uh -oh. screen. Yeah, I'm not able to. Kate, are you back? No, she's not back quite yet. This is Layla. Okay, no worries. If somebody knows how to tell me where to look to, to um, deal with the screen sharing, then let me know. If Myrna is back, she should be able to um, give Tori co-host privileges. I'll see if she's around. I'm trying, but I don't think I'm able to do that also. Okay, hopefully I was able to do that. Tori, can you try now? Can everyone see my screen now? Yep. Look good. Okay, good. Yes. All right, we're getting started again. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video um, so that my audio is a little more stable. Sorry, can and, we can we just check? Uh, We've got all. Go sorry, oh, we need to do a check. We've sure. got all the ESRC sure. members back. Of course, yeah. Uh, we've got Melissa, Lisa. Oh. Who else? Loyal. Myself. So we have four. Jim here. Uh, and Jim, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, that's that's enough. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thanks, Lanny. Um, so we'll move into the monitoring and adaptive management program for the covered seabirds. Uh, but I wanted to start by just explaining the decision making process that we've proposed actually for all covered species. And this uh, diagram um, explains that that process. Um, as we'll review uh, in a minute, there are a number of um, triggers that we've proposed and that the agencies are, are reviewing now uh, that if they're reached or exceeded or they're on track to be reached or exceeded um, would trigger uh, a mandatory collaborative process uh, between the agencies and KIUC. If the uh, green sea turtle is involved, the Division of Aquatic Resources would, would get involved as well. Um, KSC would re receive input on uh, the adaptive management uh, actions that are recommended and then make a decision uh, based on that input uh, to um, implement uh, a change if warranted uh, based on uh, what actions are available and described um, in the HCP. Um, in some cases, if there is a, um, a wide deviation in performance or if a conservation measure needs to change um, in ways um, outside of what's defined as the adaptive management process, um, there may be a need for uh, an HCP amendment, and that's a decision that the Fish and Wildlife Service and DOFA, of course, would be making um, and then advising um, KIUC to apply for uh, that permit or license amendment. Um, and then as part of the reporting process, uh, KIUC will report regularly to um, the service and DOFA about 
the uh, implementation and results of, of that management action. So let's get into some examples because this is all very conceptual um, in this flow chart. Next slide. Okay, so here's uh, an example of uh, a sampling of the monitoring as well as adaptive management triggers um, for uh, power line collisions. And so we'll go through a format similar to this uh, for several other topics and for the other um, covered species as well. Um, there will be power line strike monitoring uh, before and after minimization that will continue through um, 2026, as we described earlier. Um, to verify that the strike reduction is occurring um, as intended. Um, when new lines are installed or lines are changed, uh, there would also be uh, three years of monitoring uh, to determine strikes, um, as well as um, annual monitoring to determine uh, number of strikes uh, for uh, take uh, monitoring purposes. So an example on the right in the blue boxes of adaptive management triggers uh, for this would be if strikes are higher than predicted uh, based on the population dynamics model, that would trigger an assessment of um, what are the possible causes uh, of those higher strikes, what could be done to offset those. Um, could power lines be modified in certain ways, uh, for example, or um, could um, or are conservation sites uh, performing uh, better than expected to provide a, a larger offset? Um, if strike reduction amounts are not achieved, in other words, if, if um, we're not seeing uh, the kinds of reductions uh, that we're looking for, um, if KRC does not complete the minimization projects um, according to the HCP schedule, um, and another trigger would be uh, if the new power lines um, are not compliant with the design requirements specified uh, in the HCP. So again, these are all um, triggers uh, that would result in a mandatory um, collaboration uh, to determine next steps. Next slide. For light attraction, uh, we've talked about earlier that uh, monitoring uh, for light attraction itself um, is uh, infeasible. We can't um, monitor uh, seabird fallout uh, entirely throughout the island. Uh, so instead, uh, take and the uh, minimization of, of light attraction are um, assumed. For the covered facility lights, we can monitor that. Uh, KIC will continue to monitor for grounded birds on, on the two facilities, uh, according to the protocols outlined in the HCP. Um, grounded birds will be turned into uh, the SOS program uh, and reported immediately to the service and, and DOFA. And similar uh, searches for grounded birds uh, associated with nighttime uh, construction lighting during the fallout season. Um, there are triggers for uh, adaptive management for um, light attraction if the lights are not compliant with HCP minimization requirements, um, if groundings at the covered facilities or the construction sites are higher uh, than we've expected, uh, than we've assumed in the HCP, um, and if minimization uh, is not completed according to the schedule. And I realize these are kind of high level summaries. There's much more detail uh, in the HCP. We have uh, tables uh, in the monitoring chapter that are many pages long that describe um, exactly what these uh, triggers are quantitatively and specify uh, more uh, actions uh, that would take place as a result. Next slide. For the Save Our Shearwaters program, uh, there would be review and evaluation um, each year of the annual report um, that SOS provides uh, so that we can track the number of uh, covered species they handle each year um, and compare a three-year average of trends 
um, to determine uh, if the number of uh, covered species they're handling may be increasing. Uh, and whether the current funding level is for um, sufficient or possibly insufficient um, if uh, the level of effort uh, goes up, uh, for example, if they are having to process uh, more of the covered seabirds. Um, and then if that's the case, um, the funding level uh, will be evaluated as well. Um, and if necessary, um, KIC will um, increase funding relative to the increase in covered species uh, that SOS is processing. Key adaptive management triggers for the program include um, whether funding is not consistent with the HCP requirement, or uh, we're starting to see greater numbers of uh, covered seabirds rehabilitated by SOS, which may indicate that funding uh, is insufficient uh, or I think we lost David. I wasn't sure if that was just me or. Um... No, I, I think he dropped okay. off. Uh, yeah, I oh. dropped off. I'm back. Uh, luckily, I can rejoin very quickly. Sorry about that. Next slide. For the conservation sites, we have actually many uh, different kinds of monitoring as well as triggers for um, adaptive management action. Um, and a lot of the monitoring that has already been occurring um, that Andre and his team have been conducting for years will continue, um, just expanded to include new conservation sites um, as well. Bro monitoring, call rate monitoring, um, social attraction monitoring, um, and the monitoring that Kyle and his team does uh, for predators. Um, those are based on uh, pretty well established established uh, protocols that have been refined um, over the years and will continue. And the data we collect at those uh, conservation sites through monitoring will help us to uh, determine uh, whether those metrics that I shared earlier, uh, seven for Newell Shearwater and five for Hawaiian Petrel, um, are being met at all of the conservation sites combined. So some of the uh, management triggers for the conservation site shown on the right uh, include um, fewer than expected uh, breeding pairs uh, based on the uh, population dynamics model, um, greater uh, than expected numbers of seabirds taken uh, by predator traps, um, mitigation actions uh, perhaps not completed according to the schedule, uh, lower than expected reproductive success rates, um, and social attraction not working as expected. So again, I realize these are all very fuzzy qualitative uh, statements, um, but we have quantitative metrics uh, for all of them uh, specified in the HCP. Next slide. All right, let me pause there uh, before we move on to another set of covered species, the covered water birds. See if there's any questions from the ES ESRC members. Uh, Loyal, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, so a couple questions. Loyal, can you turn your camera on? Sorry. I might turn my, oh yeah, sorry. There we go. So a um, couple of quick questions. What kind of offsets is KUC hoping to get or expecting to get in the HCP for funding SOS? Yeah, good question. Um, the uh, SOS funding is meant to achieve um, two things. One is uh, some level of um, reduction in take or minimization. Uh, certainly some of the birds uh, that are found or uh, recovered um, by the program are a result of uh, collisions from uh, power lines or in the case of seabirds, um, fallout from uh, S from light attraction from KIC streetlights. 
Um, but the program is also um, collecting covered seabirds that have likely fallen out due to other uh, sources. So uh, light attraction from non-KIUC uh, light sources and the fact that they are able to um, collect and rehabilitate and release um, most of those um, is also a form of um, mitigation as well. Uh, and we recognize that um, not all of those released birds uh, survive in the wild, but we do have some data uh, from Andre's uh, work uh, that shows um, the program is helpful and does um, benefit the population um, with some success in, in rehabil rehabilitation and release. But then, but KIC is not actually reducing its overall take levels based upon some contribution to SOS. So the what the program is doing is for those birds that are falling out due to KIUC streetlights. Uh, there is some level of uh, take reduction. So the injury occurs, um, but the SOS program prevents the injury from becoming a mortality. So in that sense, there is uh, reduction in uh, mortality um, from, from those birds that fall out due to KIUC streetlights. Okay, thank you. And um, so these triggers that you mentioned, they may be precise, but they're not like what I would call hard triggers where if something happens, you will take action X, Y, or Z. They are, you will consult with DOFA and Fish and Wildlife Service to see what would be uh, a mutually agreed upon action to take. Is that correct? Um, in some cases, yes, that is correct. In other cases, there are uh, mandated actions. So it depends on the trigger. Um, okay. That's the kind of detail we were not able to present in these slides. So it's a combination okay. of both. Yeah. And, and my last is just a comment. You might want to consider adding some sort of survey of your lights, even if it's only a small portion of your lights, just to make sure that you're doing some survey work to assess what your outfall might be. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So, uh, Tori, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and we'll move into the Waterbird section. Go ahead and move to the next slide. So just a reminder that we are covering uh, five um, different uh, water bird species, uh, Hawaiian duck, Hawaiian common gallinule, Hawaiian stilt, um, Hawaiian goose, uh, which is of course more than a water bird, uh, and Hawaiian coot. Next slide. Um, and the effects on covered water birds are uh, somewhat more limited uh, than they are for the covered seabirds uh, in terms of where those uh, effects occur on Kauai. Um, also, as context, the water bird populations on Kauai are uh, relatively stable or increasing depending on uh, the species based on the data we have. Uh, the effect uh, on the waterbird species is also limited to uh, power line collisions uh, and to specific um, areas uh, that are high risk, uh, both on the Mana Plain, on the western uh, part of the island, and the um, Hanalei area uh, on the northern part of the island near the Hanalei National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and that's because those uh, areas have concentrations of uh, wetlands. Uh, where these water birds are concentrated um, and where they tend to fly across uh, areas uh, with existing uh, power line spans. So these areas um, have had um, unusually high numbers uh, of strikes uh, when we've measured, uh, well, Andre and his team have measured strikes of birds in general. Uh, and so as a result, we can attribute uh, the majority of those strikes um, to uh, water bird species because of that unique um, situation of the concentration of habitat uh, and power lines. 
There have also been uh, visual surveys of uh, movement of water birds in the vicinity of power lines, um, as well as SOS data of water bird injuries and fatalities, uh, both of which we've used um, to help us assess uh, strike risk. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the risk is uh, more attributed to distribution lines um, in these areas, although some strikes have occurred um, on transmission lines, and that's due uh, mostly to the different flight patterns of these water birds, um, as opposed to the seabirds, which are moving much longer distances from higher elevation um, down to the ocean. Next slide. Um, so just a few other things to note uh, before we get into the uh, take estimate for water birds. Uh, we have limited data uh, to estimate power line strikes. Um, there uh, are uh, limited field observations, as I mentioned. Um, we have actual collisions, though, only uh, observed for Nene. <laughs> And we have the acoustic monitoring uh, in those same areas um, that is designed for seabirds, but is uh, has been adapted to estimate take of water birds as well. Uh, we don't have uh, power line strike data from um, Hanalei yet. Uh, and so for now, we've taken the uh, number of power line strikes in the Mana Plain. Um, and extrapolated that to the situation in Hanalei based on the different mileage of power lines. Um, that's likely to change uh, next year because we do have uh, monitoring um, underway and planned uh, for those two areas. Uh, so we'll have improved monitoring data uh, before the final HCP. Um, as a result of this uh, limited data and the nature of the acoustic data, if you recall, which does not separate out uh, by species, uh, which type of bird is colliding, um, we've had to make assumptions of the proportion of each species or the allocation of collisions by species uh, that you can see there. Um, those estimates are based on uh, the observations of water birds uh, flying uh, near power lines. Uh, and so our uh, best estimate of the, um, the risk uh, for collisions for each species. So about half of the collisions we're estimating will be to uh, Nene, uh, about a quarter to Hawaiian duck, and the rest allocated to the other three species. Um, the take limit for water birds uh, is estimated um, at 74% of all of the recorded bird strikes um, along the Mana and Hanalei segments. And because we cannot actually separate out um, take by species, um, the take uh, will be tracked uh, in the HCP over time um, by all water bird species combined, and we've assumed a, a static proportion um, of those strikes by species. Next slide. And this is the resulting uh, estimated take uh, for uh, water birds. Um, and we, uh, you can see the column on the left, uh, the 50 year uh, total strike is shown there for all species at just under uh, 4,000. Uh, that comes out to um, about um, 78 uh, strikes uh, per year on average. And we've allocated those to either um, injury or mortality um, based on uh, the proportion of the strikes that we think uh, would result in grounding and then an allocation of each of those uh, to either injury um, or mortality. Next slide. Um, the conservation measures uh, for water birds are uh, focused primarily on power line collision minimization in those high risk areas of the Mana Plain and the Hanalei, uh, where we're using the same techniques uh, as for covered seabirds, static wire removal, and the installation of bird flight diverters. 
Um, here, though, um, we are assuming a higher uh, rate uh, or higher improvement of uh, strike reduction of 90%. Um, and that is consistent with uh, the monitoring that um, has been conducted so far, um, as well as some uh, studies of uh, other species and other locations. Uh, but we do intend to verify that uh, with the monitoring data uh, we'll be collecting both this year uh, and next year at both locations. Monitoring would continue for um, another three years, uh, both to verify the take estimate um, as well as the um, strike reduction. Next slide. Um, we'll also be counting for the covered water birds, uh, KIUC's contribution uh, to the uh, Save Our Shearwaters program. Um, there are covered water birds that SOS um, does um, collect and uh, rehabilitate and release. Uh, and those do include birds affected by K KIUC power lines, as well as from other uh, mortality sources, whether that be um, vehicle collisions or, um, or other sources of injury. Next slide. Uh, the monitoring and adaptive management uh, program for um, water birds is um, focused on monitoring the power line strikes, uh, both before and after uh, minimization at those two high-risk locations. Um, those uh, that monitoring uh, would continue uh, in places where there are new line installations or line changes um, where water birds are concentrated. Um, annual take monitoring is proposed to occur only at uh, the Manaw Plain. And adaptive management options. Uh, include additional minimization, uh, novel minimization techniques, um, and potentially replacing less effective uh, minimization with those of higher efficacy. Next slide. So I'll pause here uh, before we turn to the last covered species, uh, green sea turtle, see if there's any questions or comments on the covered water birds. Uh, Loyal, go ahead. Sorry, just one quick question that actually applies to the other um, portions as well. And is, is there, I can't remember in the first couple of slides you talked about with new power lines, is there a cap on the new lines? Or is it just everything? And is there a, and what is the approval process for those new lines? Um, so there is an estimate of uh, how the mileage of new power lines um, that would be um, installed. Uh, and um, there is no approval process per se uh, by DOFA or the Fish and Wildlife Service for KIUC uh, building those lines, uh, but they must be built according to the specifications listed in the HCP. So US Fish and Wildlife and DOFA certainly can monitor that and KIUC must report on um, implementing those um, construction guidelines uh, for all new lines. Thank you. Any other questions on the water birds? All right, uh, go ahead and share your screen again, Tori. Next slide. So this is a little bit of a reminder from the January presentation. Um, as you all know, the uh, potential impacts to sea turtles are from uh, disorientation of hatchlings uh, being attracted to light from nearby streetlights, 
um, away from the beach, um, causing them to move inland where they are at risk of dehydration, uh, starvation, vehicular impact, or predation. Um, and lights uh, near the beach may also cause adults um, to avoid nesting on beaches in the first place. The very first um, documented incident of this occurring actually happened fairly recently in Kakaha. Uh, September 2020, there was a, an incident of um, a number of green sea turtle hatchlings in the middle of the night uh, reported crossing the roadway uh, toward a nearby streetlight. Uh, the conservation measures for this species therefore aim to minimize that disorientation uh, from nearby KIUC streetlights. Next slide. To inform this analysis, um, KIUC and, and Fish and Wildlife Service uh, conducted surveys of all beaches on the island. Uh, and started that in 2019, uh, resurveyed the same areas um, in 2020, uh, and identified 29 streetlights. This is out of the 4,150 or so um, streetlights on the island. 29 of them at seven beaches um, were found to have um, light that would be visible from sea turtle nesting habitat um, at the level of the beach. And they're listed there. I'll show you a map on the next slide. Uh, we acknowledge that this might shift over time, um, both because of shifting habitat, uh, whether it be sea level rise or just simply erosion uh, or accretion of beaches. Um, the beach habitat itself may change. Also, uh, vegetation that uh, grows up or is cut down um, or buildings that are added or removed, that could also change. Uh, the level of uh, light uh, being visible uh, to sea turtle nesting habitat. So KIUC will be reassessing um, all of the beaches each year uh, to identify um, any of those changes. And if there are new streetlights uh, that are at risk of affecting uh, sea turtle hatchling movement, uh, those would be added to the program. Next slide. Um, this is a map of those 29 uh, streetlights that are visible from sea turtle nesting habitat. And this is also where uh, the management uh, and monitoring would occur. Now, it's... Um, Difficult to come up with a take estimate for um, green sea turtle. Um, in this case, uh, we did want to be um, quite conservative and um, come up with a take estimate uh, that would be um, sufficient to cover any um, instance of take. Um, we also, I think, went back and forth over the metric, the unit of take here, whether that be number of hatchlings. Uh, we settled on the number of nests uh, and um, have proposed that the permit and license allow for take of um, up to uh, 50 nests over the 50 year permit term, so an average of one per year, and that we define take of a nest. Um, as occurring when one or more um, green sea turtle hatchlings becomes disoriented. So even if there's a nest of 100 uh, hatchlings, if one hatchling in that nest uh, becomes disoriented, we count that as a take of a nest um, in that year. Um, the take limit is based on, on some monitoring data um, from the uh, Department of Aquatic Resources uh, that, that's been conducted between 2015 and 2020. Um, this is a case where we can measure actual take uh, in the field. Um, we will be uh, marking and monitoring um, all nests carefully, uh, and so we should be able to see uh, quite easily when um, hatchlings are disoriented either directly as they're moving or um, certainly evidence of disorientation based on their uh, footprints in the sand. 
Next slide. Um, the primary conservation measure for this uh, species is the uh, detection and temporary shielding of the nest. Uh, and this is uh, a measure that mirrors what is uh, being implemented for the Kauai Seabird uh, HCP. Um, it includes weekly surveys during the nesting season to locate as many nests as possible on these target uh, beaches. And then once nests are located and marked, um, we would be installing uh, light-proof uh, fencing on the beach uh, between the turtle nest uh, and the street light. So this is to uh, prevent light from influencing uh, the movement of hatchlings uh, when they emerge. And this would also be applied to cases where um, new habitat is exposed to streetlights or streetlights are newly exposing existing habitat uh, during the permit term. Next slide. We've also included a conservation measure to, uh, as Don explained earlier, um, try to uh, identify and install uh, light minimization approaches on those 29 streetlights um, that could uh, reduce or, if possible, even eliminate the need for this temporary shielding. Um, this does require um, a lot of coordination and cooperation. Um, with the county um, and the state. Uh, KIOC is actively working with them um, to identify practicable uh, minimization measures um, and how to do that. Um, if we're successful um, and we're able to um, eliminate that um, light attraction risk, uh, then there would be no need to um, shield nests um, anymore at those specific locations. Next slide. And then finally, uh, monitoring and adaptive management uh, would be, uh, in the monitoring sense, we'll be tracking whether um, nest detection um, and shielding is working. Uh, and if there was any take occurring, the triggers are quite low uh, for this, uh, where the number of uh, nests taken in any uh, year is um, two or greater or take of any number of hatchlings from undocumented nests. Next slide. All right, let me just pause there quickly before we go into the last section, which is to discuss cost funding and implementation. I believe there's about six or seven slides left. So it's... Uh, not as long a section as the others. Uh, Loyal, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm unclear what the um, offset is for the take. I understand the minimization or the at measures, but I don't know what the offset is. Yeah, good question. Our assumption is that what we're assuming for um, the beaches where there is some risk of take is an overestimate of how much uh, risk there really is. We were, were very um, conservative in determining which um, green turtle nesting habitat might be subject to uh, light attraction and disorientation. So by implementing these measures at all of those uh, beaches, we're assuming that we are also um, benefiting um, some sea turtles that could be affected by other sources of light, not necessarily street lights. So that is the, um, that is the offset. Unquantified, right? Correct. Uh, just as my opinion, that, that might be inadequate. I want to think about that. Well, our assumption also, I should say, is that these uh, minimization techniques, the light shielding on the beach, are likely to be very, very effective to the extent where in most years we don't expect any take occurring at all. So uh, if we're able to um, avoid almost all take, 
Um, there's also very little need for offset at that point. Well, I guess I'll read about it in the draft. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions on sea turtle? All right, let's move to the last section. Next slide. So um, costs and funding are an important part of any HCP. Um, we're required to uh, disclose the estimated costs of HCP implementation over the entire permit term and um, provide assurances uh, that the uh, permittee can pay for those costs. Um, so an important part of this is coming up with a, a, an accurate cost estimate. Um, um, so that we can also uh, demonstrate uh, there's sufficient funding to pay for those costs. Uh, we have an entire appendix in the HCP where we've uh, outlined all of those costs. We developed a custom uh, cost model uh, for this HCP that you'll see there with costs expressed in current dollars. Um, and understanding that costs may change slightly uh, from the current numbers I'll present today um, based on agency comments we might be getting on the, on the current draft. Um, but we do believe that the overall magnitude of costs are unlikely uh, to change. Um, you'll notice that the annual costs are greatest in the first two years, um, 2023 and uh, 2024, due to uh, the completion of power line minimization next year, um, as well as um, additional one-time costs of predator fence construction uh, in those two years. Um, many of the costs, I think, are estimated quite well because we have such a, a good track record of conducting, uh, for example, uh, the seabird uh, management at the conservation sites, uh, monitoring predator control, um, Kyle and Andre and their teams uh, have really refined these uh, methods over the years. Uh, so I think our, our, the quality of the cost estimates are, are very good uh, for those components of the program. For the green sea turtle, which would be a new program, um, they're based on DAR's experience um, around the state on a smaller scale, and we've simply um, scaled those up. And then we have uh, incorporated a contingency uh, for uh, some of the cost components to account for um, uncertainty. Uh, the power line minimization uh, projects um, cost estimate is uh, $23 million. Um, and some of that has uh, already been um, spent. In fact, the majority um, has already been spent in the last a couple of years um, and expected through the end of this year. Next slide. And here are the cost estimates broken down by various cost categories. And you'll notice uh, the first two columns there are the 2023 and 2024 costs, uh, which are uh, quite a bit higher than the average annual cost after that because of those one-time costs I mentioned earlier in power line collision minimization, the second row, and managing and enhancing the conservation sites, the fourth row. Um, so after that, uh, starting in 2025, costs stabilize and are focused primarily on maintenance. There really are no uh, one-time costs after that. Uh, but we have accounted for replacement costs of all of the equipment and facilities uh, over the 50-year period. Next slide. You can see the proportion of various costs uh, here, which is quite um, typical of a lot of HCPs where the majority of costs are spent on the conservation measures. 
Uh, that's uh, just over a third and just under a third spent on the monitoring program. Again, very typical. Where we have uh, other substantial costs are uh, change circumstances and remedial actions um, necessary to address them if they occur. Um, as well as the uh, remaining costs for minimization measures and the replacement costs for those structures and adaptive management and contingency. Next slide. For funding assurance, um, the chapter uh, of the HCP describes um, KIUC's commitment to fully fund uh, the HCP and um, we believe demonstrates they do have the financial capacity uh, to pay for those costs. And I think one important point is their past performance in uh, spending uh, actually more on a per annum um, on power line minimization, uh, monitoring and, and conservation actions, uh, and in some cases more than what's projected for uh, the rest of the uh, HCP permit term on an annual basis. The cost of HCP implementation will be part of KIUC's operational costs, um, just as they are now, um, which is passed on to ratepayers. So all costs associated with um, the ongoing operation, maintenance, and construction of utilities um, are expected to be part of that rate-based cost um, that would be then uh, passed on to ratepayers. Um, funding would occur as part of the annual budget cycle uh, KIOC has now, um, but for specific elements um, that are more kind of long-term and somewhat more unknown, um, KIC will secure a letter of credit, uh, and that would be for adaptive management actions if those actions exceed um, existing costs, um, as well as remedial actions in response to change circumstances. Um, many adaptive management changes we expect to be cost neutral, um, simply because the goal there is to adjust um, actions to improve their performance. Um, and that may include uh, discontinuing certain actions that are not effective um, or uh, changing actions in ways that just make them uh, perform better, but may not actually increase cost. But if there are increases, uh, that's what the adaptive management budget is for. Um, and that would be secured and guaranteed uh, through a letter of credit, along with remedial actions, uh, which would be necessary if a change circumstance occurs. Next slide. Uh, there is an implementation chapter uh, of the HCP which describes the implementation responsibilities of KIUC, of the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and the Department of Land and Natural Resources through DOFA. <clears throat> KIUC, of course, is responsible for all day-to-day um, -day administration and implementation of the plan. Uh, there will be annual reports um, submitted uh, to the agencies, um, as well as to um, ESRC. Um, this chapter also describes the change circumstances and goes into quite a lot of detail um, of the uh, five uh, change circumstances um, listed there. Um, severe weather, the first uh, category, um, does uh, include uh, quite an extensive discussion of the possible effects of climate change on the frequency and severity um, of those various uh, weather phenomenon and the resulting um, flooding or landslides um, that might occur. So we do take that into account um, as part of uh, change circumstances. Next slide. And this is our earlier slide of schedule and next steps. So this is a repeat of uh, the same slide earlier as a reminder of what's coming.
And I believe that is the last slide. So we can go to your questions. Thank you. Do you mind um, backing up to the, the um, budget breakdown? Sure. And my question is just around, um, you know, I, I, the graphs of, of the trajectory, which as Loyal mentioned, doesn't cover the, the dramatic declines that occurred from the, you know, the 1990s through the early 2000s. And so the dramatic decline it's taken over the last decades. And so I, I, when we think about the trajectory moving forward and the fact that it continues to go down for decades before dipping back up again, um, that uncertainty to me is really important. And knowing that what we're doing is working, even when we continue to see declines and that, you know, that lag is going to eventually it's, it's eventually going to kick in. And so I guess, um, you know, I see this money in here for adaptive management, which I assume is if there's change circumstances. No, you've got a separate line for change circumstances. But tell me a little bit about where the monitoring and, and improved modeling and, you know, improved po population estimates. How do you know that what you're doing is working? Is there money in here for that monitoring? Because that it actually takes a bit to know that what you're doing is working. I'll um, defer to anybody else, David and Tori and even Andre, if you want to add in here to what I'll what I'm going to say. But I'll just start by saying we do know that the conservation efforts work. Um, we know that because of the last um, 10, 10, 10 or so years of data collection. I mean, we have. Um, information in all the annual reports that are produced by Andre and his team, Halex and his team, uh, Kyle and his team at Halex and the NTBG team, where we see that the population trends are increasing. Po population growth is happening at the conservation sites. Predation is dropping dramatically, has dropped dramatically. So we know that what we're doing at the conservation sites is working. Um, so the monitoring is already in place for that and, and is already factored into the cost. Um, I should correct something. So at, the, at those okay. mitigation sites, you're totally correct. Predator control, there's people paid to be on the ground monitoring and making sure there aren't incursions and all of that. But what about the modifications to the power lines to decrease mortality moving forward? And there's still uncertainty about that, about, you know, um, fallout rates and, and whether those are meeting expectations and how that's impacting projections of growth that are built into um, this HCP? Power line monitoring is already occurring and is factored into that, that cost. Um, for fallout for streetlights, um, we, we discussed that with the agencies. We all came to sort of the same kind of general agreement that it's not possible to monitor that in the same way that it is um, power line strikes. We, we just don't have the tools to do that. Um, but uh, SOS is a good monitoring tool in terms of what's happening with fallout while they do not, obviously all the birds are not turned in. Some birds are turned in. So what happens with SOS has been used as a tool in the past to sort of track what's happening with fallout and will continue to be a tool that we have um, to track what's happening with fallout. Um, that that cost is factored in to the HCP. So it, I, at least from my perspective at this point, I think the monitoring costs have been factored in. We, we obviously do not know what's going to happen in the future, which is, um, you know, the adaptive management and change circumstances are, are to address things that we can't for we don't foresee at this point in time or we don't know what will happen at this point in time. But I, I think the monitoring costs are factored in and in place. They are. And if Tori could share that slide again, I'll point out to Melissa where that line item is. It may not be labeled so clearly, um, but the, the row 
There we go. The row that's called Seabird Colony Monitoring Program. That is monitoring of the conservation sites, all 10 of the conservation sites. So we have nearly a million dollars um, per year allocated um, just to the monitoring um, of uh, those 10 conservation sites. And that's um, pretty extensive monitoring. Um, it's it being expanded from what's being conducted today uh, in order to capture those, those new sites um, and ensure that we're able to uh, detect uh, any deviations from expectations. So remember those metrics that I showed earlier, the seven metrics for Newell Shearwater and five for Hawaiian Petrol. Um, those are all meant as early warning uh, systems where we're, um, we've defined a number of very specific quantitative triggers um, to um, really uh, ensure that if there are problems at any of those conservation sites, we detect them early. Um, that is in KIUC's interest, right? Because it's it's their responsibility to ensure that all 10 of those conservation sites uh, meet those uh, population targets. So the people doing the data collection are often not the people making the models. I know there's a lot of uncertainty in both the starting population estimates you know, and, and then the different parameters going into those. And so is, is does that budget line item also include um, continued modeling efforts and population estimates? Because um, again, those, those are, while the data feed in from the people on the ground at the seabird colonies, it's typically not the same person doing the models as it is collecting the on the ground data. Uh, David, I'm gonna, David Zip, and I'm gonna leave it up to you to talk about what's covered in the cost estimate, but I, I just to sort of tie a bridge here for you, um, we, we, I think we're very lucky to have Andre as part of the team and to be working with Andre. Andre does work very closely. He, he does a lot of his own modeling. So a lot of modeling actually does come out of ARC, both for um, uh, using power line uh, monitoring data that's collected and also the seabird colony monitoring. So, there is some modeling that comes out of that that's factored into these costs. And then also they, uh, Andre and Mark have been working very closely with John Brandon at ICF um, on the population dynamics model. And then David, I'm gonna leave it up to you to talk about population dynamics modeling and whether or not long-term costs have been model factored in for that kind of monitoring. Um, yes, they have. So we've accounted for uh, the costs of uh, rerunning the model um, periodically to account for uh, changes, um, but um, it is just a model. So what's more important, honestly, is what's actually happening at the conservation sites um, and whether those uh, triggers are uh, reached and whether we're meeting those specific metrics that we can measure in the field um, through the on-the-ground monitoring program. I will say uh, there's one exception to this, and that's the sea turtle program. That's a new program for us. So we don't, we ourselves do not have direct experience with that program, but we have cost estimates from a couple of different resources. Um, one is actually Department of Aquatic Resources, um, the state, and the other is a private entity. Um, and we also uh, have information on other sea turtle programs um, happening in Hawaii, but also in other parts of the U.S. So, but we don't have direct experience with that one. I think Loyal has his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so, when I you can answer or ask or let me know whether or not you think this is right, but it kind of sounds like we're kind of writing off the uh, Newell Shearwaters anyway, and maybe the petrols from the southern part of the island and maybe part of the east and focusing on the the um, Nepali area on that. So if that's the case, should we be putting, you know, three and a half million dollars into power line uh, improvements when we're in the not too distant future may not have herds going through those areas. Just a question. That was my point. It's 
it's a good good food for thought. Um, our goal is our goal has been, and I I I think continues to be to minimize all all take to the extent that we can. Um, it's my understanding that eventually all all, all the impacts combined, um, birds on the you know in that greater area, Kikahata Hanale, are just at such a high level of risk. It it is possible they'll eventually either die away or move into the northwest corner. Um, I, I still think the minimization is very beneficial because we're getting the benefits now um, versus you know, what may be happening in 30 years with the birds in that Kikahata Hanale area. Andre, I don't know if you want to, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of, I get what you're saying there, Loyal, but, um, you know, we're talking about populations, for example, in Hanale um, on the North Shore, um, which uh, are impact going to be impacted by minimization actions, which will help slow down the decline there. And ultimately, this is a model. So, you know, the model kind of has all that entire area winking out of existence. But I think if you start removing um, the take of thousands and thousands of birds, you know, maybe that will have an unforeseen positive impact. And then on top of that, like Don says, it does mean that there's a pool of birds that are circulating out there, especially juvenile birds, which could be drawn to areas with larger populations of birds um, over the next, say, 10 years, which are in areas that are managed. So... I think you don't want to just completely write them all off. It's, um, you know, we know minimization works. We know it's preventing take, reducing take. Um, and any endangered bird, any extra endangered bird that's out there is better than zero, right? Yeah, but is it better than having 12 versus 10 conservation areas? Don, I'll leave that, that to you. Yeah, I I mean, based on what I understand of all the analyses conducted to date, and that's before I started, which was January 22, all the past analyses that I've seen and all the analysis that I've seen since I started in 2022, um, minimization has a pretty significant benefit. So I, I would argue that the minimization that's occurring now is, is very beneficial. And I, I think the best that we can do at this point in time in combination with the conservation sites that we have. So- Yeah, um, give me your, your graph show, it still goes down, it doesn't show any, um, breakthrough kind of uh, action and when you look at the gray line versus the blues and purple lines it's, it's not altering much I mean it's just a food for thought for you guys I mean you're putting 3.5 million dollars into that and um, well I'd, I'd also um, point out that uh, you know through our tracking work we have seen that some a small percentage of birds that pass over those power lines are actually birds that are breeding in conservation management areas. Um, so, you know, like we, we've had at least one bird passing over the power line trail, the, the worst power line collision area, um, which was breeding in North Bog. So there is a, a small proportion of birds that are in the Northwest, which are passing over these lines as well. And as that population increases, you know, that minimization of those areas would have a positive impact on those birds because they won't be dying as they head towards their colony. So. I think it's uh, it's kind of like a um, bang for your buck thing too. Like you know, you can minimize quickly and effectively and reduce the the death of thousands of birds in a short period of time. That's got to have some sort of positive impact on the population as a whole, and even the birds that are breeding in the northwest, where they're less impacted by power line collisions. Also, I'll point out. That, um, Sorry, go ahead, David. I'll just point out that I, I I think that that train has left the station in in a lot of ways because KIOC has conducted um, most of those power line minimization projects already. So loyal, you're right. There there is some additional work to be done um, this month and next year, uh, but um, that funding has been allocated and and those projects are are moving forward. 
you know, so if it's stuff that you've already spent this year before this HCP is signed, it doesn't really count towards the HCP. Well, it does in the sense that we've reduced our take of covered species. And that's very important because we'd also reduce the offset that is needed to um, offset the impacts of that, that take. So um, any money that KIC invests in reducing take uh, from their perspective, uh, benefits them in in not having to do as much um, offset and, and conservation. I completely agree with that part of it. That part I understand, but just from the net benefit of the birds um, was my question on that. But it's more food for thought than anything else. But yeah, it reduces what you have to then in turn put back into the HCP if you can reduce those upfront costs of group of, population of birds is going to go out anyway. Well, I also think there's a, a genetics benefit. So if you think about the long life histories of these birds, how long they take to reach maturity, all of that, the longer you have the potential for those birds to contribute to genetic diversity of, of the meta population, I think you're better off. So even though they do continue to go down, you keep them as Andre said, as potential sources of genetic diversity and other things like that for the meta population. So I think I, I think there's value in slowing that decline um, as much as possible, even though the the arrow still goes down. But I think it's it's a great question to ask. <laughs> Food for thought, good discussion. <laughs> I also think there are other things out there that we you know we don't really know the results of yet. We know that the county is. Um, you know, stray cats is something that's been an ongoing discussion on Kauai, and and there are movements um, that that will impact the stray cat population, which may change that trajectory of that area, Kikahara Hanale. Andre mentioned earlier, it's just loaded with predators in those areas. Cat feral cats being a primary one, and so. Anything that I agree with what Melissa said, anything we can do to slow that decline is a positive. Um, and and it may be that other efforts also slow that decline. So the results, the modeled results we're seeing today may may be wrong. Any other questions on the cost estimate or funding or implementation? or on the schedule or next steps and where we go from here. All right, well, we may have just exhausted you after <laughs> uh, four and a half hours. Um, so thank you very much for all of your time. We know this is a big time commitment for everyone. Um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to present this information in advance of your receiving um, the public draft HCP for your review. I don't see Kate on. Is there someone else responsible for closing out? <laughs> That's why I was looking for Kate too. <laughs> Um, Sorry, okay. I'm here. We were just muted, and I didn't know if Lainey wanted to do it. But thank you guys for for everything. We will send you the draft when we get it. And I don't know if Lainey has anything else that she wants to say. Um, no, just thanks everyone. Um, yeah, hanging in there. So a lot of information, and uh, yeah, good discussion. Thank you. Then thanks everyone. Thank thanks everyone. Aloha. Okay. Well, it's funny because once David Hinkin got off, they moved right along. <laughs> but I think after lunch, everybody was.